How are you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tier Talk. Guys, great discussion today. We're going to talk about eight myths about admin. My guests today are going to be Russ Hamilton, Joe Paponio, William Young from Just Corrections. And we are really going to discuss our perspective on, I guess, what people believe admin is all about. It's going to be an interesting discussion. Hopefully, it provides some perspective. Now, granted, there are going to be a lot of people that may not fit the needed perspective. But with that said, these are going to be the expectations of when you cross into an admin role, what is expected of you. Now, guys, before we introduce our guest, just let you know, Inmate Manipulation Decoded is on the market. If you guys haven't picked it up, please get it. It's a great book. It's available on Amazon and it's used for training all across the country. Saves jobs. Definitely saves jobs. We also have How to Succeed in Corrections, Lessons Learned While Working in a Prison. This is available by Blue 360 Media. That's my publisher. Uh, again, this book's got tons of details, tons of information. It's not just written from just my perspective. I did get passages and quotes from other people in the profession as well. And then to complement these books, we also have tips for new correction officers and their supervisors. Uh, again, it complements the other books on the market. Same thing. We got passages, but we also have dedicated quotes from other professionals in the field. I'm currently working on another leadership book right now. It's a lot of work right now trying to do a uh, passage daily. I'm um, a little behind, maybe one or two days behind, but we are making progress. And before we start, I just want to uh, read something that came my way that I thought was interesting. I got this from a criminal justice professional, uh, instructor, sorry, out of uh, Tennessee. He says, Anthony, I'm a criminal justice correctional officer instructor for the Tennessee College of Applied Technology. My background is in federal law enforcement, and I have little experience in corrections other than putting criminals in the system. While looking for resources, I found Tear Talk, and I love it. I've made inmate uh, manipulation decoded part of my curriculum. Additionally, I'm waiting for your two other books to arrive from Blue 360 Media. The reason for this email is to thank you and, you and reinforce the concept of inmate manipulation. One of my students was sworn in yesterday as a CO for the, uh, the Harding County Sheriff's Department in Tennessee. Prior to being sworn in, she was interviewed and given a tour of the facility by a senior CO. The manipulation began immediately. While touring the kitchen, an inmate began chatting her up. The senior officer removed her from the engagement immediately. After my student was returned to me at the end of the tour, the COs went back to the inmate to counsel him for talking to the new CO. Thankfully, because of your resources, we were able to discuss what had happened and reinforce the importance of your instruction. Thank you so much for taking your time to pass your knowledge onto those of us less experienced in the CO field. Job well done. And that's coming from Tim Foster. And I, I and he also, just to give a shout out, he messaged me uh, prior and uh, basically he wanted me to make sure that I gave a shout out to Russ. So Russ, when I come on, Tim Foster says hi. All right, let's get Russ on. What's up, Russ? Hey, Anthony. How's it going, uh, sir? Good. Russ, you mind introducing yourself to our audience and giving a shout out uh, to Tim Foster? Absolutely. First of all, Tim Foster, you know, it's uh, it's always good to get, you know, feedback and understand, you know, where we're, uh, where we're meeting, uh, you know, our obligations and responsibilities, where we're falling short. But, um, you know, getting that kind of comment back um, just reinforces, you know, what tier top keepers of chaos, um, you know, uh, William Young, just corrections, um, that what all of that is all about. So, you know, it's, it's really appreciated and knowing that we're making that kind of impact and being able to, you know, uh, you know, actually be portrayed in front of all of these people that are, you know, learning in IST or whatever, um, your particular curriculum is called there is, is fantastic. Um, having said that, my name is Russ Hamilton. I'm a former and retired sergeant from California Department of Corrections. Um, I am also a former uh, senior juvenile correctional officer. I currently work for a company uh, that does uh, reentry and rehabilitation work uh, for inmates at a local county jail where I'm the case manager and a local county probation department where I also um, have some influence and a bit of the caseload there as well. Um, I'm also the founder of uh, Keepers of Chaos, which is on Facebook. And that website is dedicated to the brave men and women in corrections and is dedicated toward making them more efficient, more safe, more secure in the jobs that they do through training, uh, history, and everything else that goes along with this uh, 
wonderful, but sometimes uh, difficult profession. And congratulations on your milestone of breaking over 6,000. Now you're pushing. Yeah. 6, yeah. It, it, it took, it took Zuckerberg long enough. I think that uh, we got sandbagged for a little bit along the way, but we've broken that ceiling now. Welcome to the club. All right, let's get Joe. What's up, Joe? Hey, evening, guys. How are y'all? Good. Joe, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience, sir? Yes, sir. My name is Joe Pomponio. I'm a former and retired lieutenant from the Texas Department of Corrections of 29 years. Currently working as an assistant jail administrator in our local sheriff's department jail division and panel member here for Tear Talk. And we love having you, Joe, by the way. And guess who else we got? We got author William Young, author of When Home Becomes a Housing Unit, right here. And the Nothing That Never Happens, two great books that are now always a part of my Aww. library. Yeah, you know that. Come on, Will. Hey, Will, how, how's everything going? The YouTube channel? What's going on with you, man? Oh, you know, just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with you, man. You, you, set the, you set the bar, you set the pace, and the rest of us just got to chase you. I would show you my copy of Inmate Manipulation Decoded, but it's at work. And that's my copy that you signed, I have, that I hold on to, I sleep with. Uh, and then I, I purchased, I purchased several other copies and, uh, I'm handing them out like candy at work. Um, because there are, uh, there's some, that's some good stuff in there, man. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I can't show it to you. Uh, but otherwise, no, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to fight the good battle of bringing information on wellness to correctional staff everywhere. And, uh, and I'm working on another book as well. Uh, just trying to refine the message and get it out to as many people as possible. So I appreciate you letting me come on. It's always a, it's always a joy to hang out with you and, and big Russ and, and, and meeting Joe. It's uh, I'm starstruck every time starstruck. Yeah. Right. Well, first off, thank you for all you do as well. I mean, obviously I, I've been watching you out the conferences going to Colorado. I also listen to your podcast. I love the one recently where the gentleman said that uh, the officer pretty much runs their own little prison, right. their own little jail. Uh, I watch everything you do. I watch all your videos. I watch all your podcast uh i've been um i i think it was it episode six or seven now on the podcast or so yeah seven or eight or I, I don't, i'm not even really keeping track i don't know where i'm at it's a good podcast thank you sir i i you know what's funny is i i appreciate you saying that i i was going through some old emails the other day uh cleaning out the office and i came across the original email i sent out when uh i the first book was getting published and i the publisher asked me who do you want to, if you could pick anybody in the whole wide world to review your book, who would it be? Who's your dream? And I remember just little old me just sitting there watching tear talk videos saying, gosh, if I could only get Anthony to look at my book, my whole life would be made. And, and now look right now I'm like, now I'm like, oh yeah, uh, I could just text the dude if I want to, you know, but, uh, yeah. So no, I appreciate you doing that, man. Your, your, uh, your support, uh, it means a lot to me. And, and obviously the, the, you know, the tear talk empire that you've, that you've built and all the, mm. all the lives that you've touched, man, is really for, for, for our profession. Um, I don't know if you feel like this, but I feel like it's exploding. Like now there are resources and there's people that are digging into it, uh, you know, not only on Keepers of Chaos and, and Tear Talk, but they're reading books, they're watching videos, they're consuming content because uh, people want to know what we do. And yeah. and uh, and I mean, that's it's a fantastic place to be, brother. So I, pr I appreciate it. I appreciate you, too, man. Obviously, you got you're making that difference. I mean, officers, mental health and wellness is key. It's something that people did not invest much in. And all of a sudden, William Young comes in and reminds people, including management, get more invested. I mean, mm -hmm. take care of your people, but also take care of yourself. Uh, so this is going to be an interesting dialogue. So guys, uh, for the people that are watching, uh, we are going to basically put a myth out there and then we're going to circle around and either agree with the myth or disagree, whatever it is, it's be, or, or provide both perspectives. But the key here mm -hmm. is no one's going to be right or wrong because whether uh, it's true or not. If that person believes it, it's true to them. So I think this will be a great dialogue to kind of also build clarity because three of us now are on the admin level, uh, myself, uh, Will, and and uh, 
and and Joe and Russ was a retired sergeant, but now he's on the rehabilitation side. So he's we all got pretty good perspective here. So let's just see where this dialogue goes. I already see Russ. Let me see your knuckles. Make sure that that's still dragging. <laughs> All right. Just I, th I think I, I think maybe a little bit, you know. I think that certain personas help you get the point across. I'll, I mean, right. I think I mean, it's hard for me to judge, but I think that a lot of my uh, caseload people, it eventually slipped out that you know I was uh, former corrections, former sergeant, and stuff, and I thought that that was going to be a drag, and it's actually just been uh, fantastic for one reason or another. They identify with that better than anything else. And a lot of them are on, you know, probation or parole. Um, you know, some of them are still in jail, obviously, because I do the, a big part of my caseload there. But it's actually been a big plus for me, surprisingly enough. Yeah, Russ will be like, you see that program? You're going to take it. Or you see that area where there's no camera? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so let, let's do this. So I'm going to start with Will first, and then we'll go to Russ and then Joe, and then I'll go last. But uh, And then the second question will kind of mess around with the uh, rotation. But the first Smith here, here we go. Let's just get it out there. Let's just everything out there right now. So crack your knuckles, Will, because the first one is coming at you hard. All right. Here's the first one. Admin cares more about the inmates. And let me just zoom in on Will. Mm. I will mute my side. Wow. Uh, this is a, a common, this is a common theme. This is the battle cry for for frontline staff, the, you know, the, there's, there's a division, uh, a perception of a division that exists. And I think always will to some extent, but I, I don't like the wording of this. I don't like the word care, uh, because I, and, and maybe I'm an, uh, I'm an optimist and I want to just put this out there real quick is I may wear slacks to work now, but I wore, I wore that polyester uniform for 18 years before I, before I flipped over. So, uh, the, 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 I have a hard time believing that um, there are people in leadership positions that are going out of their way to uh, disrespect staff, to mistreat staff. I know somebody's going to have a you know a, a, a reason and example, and I get that. But to, but to say that somebody cares more about the inmates than they do the the people that are willing to die for their mission statement, I really have a problem with that. And and Anthony, when we talked the other day on the phone, I like what you said. You know, if you change that care to to priority, uh, then it kind of changes everything differently. Because like it or not, you know, whether you're working the front line or the front office, inmates are our business. We we our job is to carry out you know, our carry ourselves professionally is to, we have, we have, we have things that we have to do for these people. And so, so care might be a weird word for that, but, but we do have to do certain things for the population by law, by, by policy, et cetera. And so I, I think that, that in, in nobody's mind, would you prioritize, um, if you're on the jail side or the prison side, the, you know, the uniform side, uh, you know, you, the, the, the men and women, the people that work for you, sweat for you, bleed for you, work countless of hours of overtime for you. Would you say that I don't care about them? I don't want to make them a priority. The perception comes in when you are on the battlefield in the war zone, getting beat down and looking at the, the job looking at the things that you do from the ground level. And so you don't always see all of the things that are going into it, all of the conversations, all of the battles that are being fought. Uh, but I like what you said, Anthony. It, none of that really matters because it's it's people's reality are their reality. And whether you're a frontline staff member, a midline supervisor or an administrator, it's important for you to take into consideration the perspective of the person that you're dealing with. So if you're running a facility and you feel like frontline uh, feels like you don't care about them, then then you have to do some work. You have to figure out how to chip that away. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a, a kind of a tumultuous situation. And, and on, on the flip side, if you're a frontline worker, an officer, a correctional professional, 
and you feel like administration doesn't care, uh, then then seek them out. Uh, be that bridge. There are there are there are answers to your questions if you go and ask them. So I don't like the wording in this, Anthony. I don't think I think that it would I would have to say myth that admin cares more about the inmates than they do their staff. I think if you I think in a reality, they have to care about everything that happens, inmates, staff, the plumbing that breaks, the generator that goes out, you know, buying a new van, all of those things, but their priorities are much different. So that that's my take on that. I'm going to say, I'm going to say myth on this one. All right. I'll go second. Uh, I'm going to agree with everything Will said. Uh, I believe it's also a myth. I've had Family members on one end tell me I care more about staff than I do the inmates. And then I've also had uh, staff tell me I sometimes, you know, I care more about uh, the inmates uh, than I do staff. And the funny thing is, uh, I like what uh, Will said. Uh, it's not about care. It's about where I prioritize. So like if a family member tells me, do I take the word of staff first? Yes, 100%. They're paid in trusted positions, unless I have a re reason to question their credibility. They are in an authority position. If I did not value their word first, why would I be putting them in that position? Mm -hmm. So that's an easy question for me. You know, when 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 we're kind of battling of who's right or who's wrong, I'm going to lean on what my custody people are telling me or what my staff members are telling me, unless there's a reason not to. And if there's a reason not to, they wouldn't be in the position. You know, it's that simple. So when people ask me, and again, it's a myth, uh, does admin care more about the inmates? I, I mean, at the end of the day, we're admin. We have to be objective. We're hired to make sure that the facility runs in accordance to policy, procedure, law, whatever it is. And if I went out there to the public and I told people that I literally care for staff, uh, but I don't really care for the inmates or I care for staff more than I care for the inmates, whichever, however someone wants to subjectively take that, they're not going to see me uh, in the objective manner that I'm supposed to be seen. So having said that, uh, I have to, have to give uh, that same level of care across the board because to me at my position, every life could be a liability. A staff member getting hurt, 100% could be a liability. A staff member getting killed, 100% could be a liability. But when you're admin, an inmate getting hurt could be a liability. An inmate getting killed could be a liability. So having said that, whether it's care for inmates or care for staff, admin has to care for the life that's under its supervision. Uh, so with that said, uh, does admin care more about the inmates? That is a myth. That is a myth. We care about the lives that are under our area of responsibility and within our charge. All right. So uh, next one is Russ. Russ, which, so so far we got two for myth. I, I'm, I'm nervous about Russ here, but what do you got, Russ? Uh, okay. As with everything that I that I try and um, you know examine in an objective manner is um, that. You know, the thing that tends to happen, um, especially perhaps with uh, with line staff, is uh, it's easy to broadly generalize. It's easy to make things stick, you know, when we have a really huge target. And so uh, part of that, you know, is kind of, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy about the way that um, we on those on that, you know, that first line begin to talk about things. Because it's much more easy to identify something that's negative than something that's positive. Um, it's just like, you know, the the journalists, you know, down at the TV station, uh, you know, they're not reporting on every single airplane that makes a safe, sane landing at the airport, right? It's the ones that crash and burn. And so it's much easier to get caught up, you know, in the talk and the things that happen when there is, um, you know, a supervisor, a manager, an admin who has done something negative for whatever reason, regardless of their right or wrong, it's easier to talk about that. And so that can tend to uh, take on a life of its own. Um, the other thing that, you know, I tend to see is, is um, for one reason or another, sometimes 
Um, you know, some of these admins, they're not good at communicating what is, what is actually happening um, to, uh, that's my dog out there, uh, what's actually, you know, happening um, in these situations and so forth. Um, the second thing is, is, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of uh, propagandizing that can happen to some of the admins where what they hear day in, day out, they hear from a hundred different inmates, but only one or two officers, right? And so it becomes easier to think about things in terms of what the inmates are saying. They have a louder voice. It's more continuous. They always hit the same points. And sometimes that results in a negative outlook from admin to the officers. And so from that standpoint, you can kind of see that, well, you know, they could get to a point where they might be doing some things that do make it appear as if uh, the inmates are being prioritized, right? And so uh, all of that negativity together just, you know, becomes, you know, a great big bunch of bullshit that's hard to overcome. But when we strip it down to its barest essentials and we look at, and we look at, you know, things that are the broad generalities and we do away with those and we try and focus on the specifics and why things happened and whether or not we have missed communication, it becomes a little bit easier. And under those circumstances, I think that you can call this a myth, right? But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have facets of it that um, have become true or have become true in the minds of some people. And so uh, that's, uh, that's the nuance, I think, that, that I can add to that. And I think that that's a good reason to try and build bridges, you know, build communication and try and put things out there where we're able to develop, you know, at least a tolerance for each other. Um, there are a lot of places that um, are do much better at that. It's not just tolerance, you know, they work hand in hand. Um, but I think that it would be well advised by admin um, to try and increase the amount of empathy that they have for the line staff because the things that do happen down at that level are life and death oftentimes. And sometimes uh, when that's happening to us, it's easier for us to get out of kilt with our emotions because for us, it seems to matter so much more. And so when you take into account the dynamics of these things and how they interact together, I think that that's what you're left with. So I, I do call it a myth mostly. Yeah, and 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 before we get to Joe, you made a very good point. The amount of uh, the amount access, the amount of access that inmates have, whether directly or indirectly, to admin, uh, is is I don't think a lot of people know that. I mean, you got access, let's say, through the grievance system, through the families that call, the lawyers, the legislators, the you know the obuds person. So you're right. You know, you probably hear from inmates uh, more uh, than you do from staff most of the time, or at least number wise. But having said that. When you get all these complaints, and let's say they're coming from, you know, all, all different angles here, I may only go to one strong supervisor to tell me what's really going on. You know what I mean? So you, you may have like 10 inmates, whatever, but one strong supervisor can equate to 10 inmates, I guess, you know, if, if you want to look at the ratio of that. Uh, <coughs> all right, Joe, what do you think, Joe? Is this a myth? Does admin care more about the inmates? Oh, uh, you're, you're on mute. We got you. Yeah, you you're there, Joe? Yeah, I got you, Joe. I'll unmute you. You got okay. yeah, you got it. He's there. I was gonna say, there. Did, did William have a follow-up for, for us? Oh, sorry, I missed that. Will you got a follow-up on that, Will? I didn't want to I didn't want to cut you off, Joe. Uh -oh. And I don't I, you know, I don't want to drag this uh, this out. But Russ, I loved I love what you said. And so I'm wondering if does it look like so I, I think I think one of the things that we do so poorly in corrections is because there are things in prisons and jails that have to happen and be dealt with immediately. Some of our uh, long-term kind of goals and some of the, the projects and things that, that maybe don't need to happen today uh, get pushed to the back burner. So because of you bringing up, you know, Hey, you know, the, the, the complaints that come in and the, and the inmates have the attention of the, uh, you know, of, of, of administration. And those are, those are sometimes issues that have to be handled and dealt with right now. Do you feel like sometimes that's why staff maybe feel disenfranchised because some of that, you know, pushes then the, the staff uh, on the, to the back burner a little bit, because we can, 
staff are always there. Staff, maybe we can get to in a little bit, but this issue right now, we have to get to to right now. I mean, I I kind of feel like that's maybe what you were saying a little bit. Yeah, um, you know, when you just look at, you know, there's there's competing, there's, you know, um, competing priorities from both sides. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, if there's not empathy, from the part of the line staff to understand what it is um, the admin is trying to do or accomplish or deal with, um, then, you know, we have to assign something to it. And so what do we assign to it? We assign to the fact that, Hey, you know what, they are just more invested in, in the inmates. They like them better. They care more for them. They are prioritizing them. And um, I would say that that's generally not true, but there may be instances, specific cases where that is, but I think on the other side of the equation, you also have, um, you know, admin who are nece not necessarily all that empathetic toward line staff. And, uh, you know, uh, they have all of this uh, stuff going on in front of them that involves inmates and they're getting through it and they're, you know, solving this, that and the other thing. And they're not very empathetic toward their line staff and they're ignoring them kind of. And it looks uh, and they feel like, hey, you know what, the line staff are the ones that actually, you know, are, are making life hard for us instead of remembering that a lot of times they're dealing with stuff that uh, admin is never going to have to deal with because I think there are a lot of really efficient units out there that are actually doing a great job. And I think, you know, we're like ships in the night sometimes, you know, we're just passing by each other and we're never seeing what, you, what each other is doing. And we need to take the time to make sure that we establish, um, you know, better communication lines. And I really think that that's what it's all about. I've been guilty of it in the past. I'm sure, you know, administrators have. And then there may be times where I've been spot on um, in some conflicts that I've had where they really were, you know, denigrating staff to the point where they were deprioritizing even right. safety and security. But those are the exception and not the rule. Thanks. Yeah, that, 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 that was a good question, Will, because I'm actually thinking like if you're in admin uh, and you just take everything that comes your way at face value, uh, you will literally think that your facility is falling apart before it's getting better because the right. amount of complaints that are coming your way uh, and then the amount of solutions are really going to be, uh, one, maybe longer to get to you, but also not as heavy as the complaints that are coming your way. So having said that, I, I think if you have administration that really doesn't know how to see through the BS – uh, they may find it safer to side with the inmates, unfortunately. Um, right. But if you get a strong person there that's kind of worked with the inmates, talked to the inmates, and kind of see through the bullshit, uh, they may not be as paranoid, and they may be willing now to go back and talk to staff and let's try to figure out the truth. Because that's what we kind of usually do. It's like, okay, what just came out my way? I get it. Let's just figure out the truth behind it because I know this one. And this one's going to throw everything there, not so you can fix it, but so they can push for a lawsuit. You know, so a lot of the stuff that they put out there is not really meant to be fixed. <laughs> they hate it when you look at something real quick because they want to leave it out there and they could say that that's the one thing that was unaddressed. Uh, that was a great question, Will, and great, great response, uh, Russ. Actually, so good that we don't even need Joe's opinion anymore. No, uh, no, no. Let's, let's, no I'm, kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead, Joe. I guess so. So I'm the, the lower left of this Brady bunch here. I guess I'll have to be the butthole. Uh, do I do I feel that this is a myth? I'm going to say partially yes, and I'm going to say partially fact. And the reason why I say fact is uh, we have to face the fact that you know most of your admin, you know, when it comes to running a penitentiary, you know, on a on an everyday layer is responsible for running a, you know, two or 3,000 bed, sometimes 5,000 bed political shit show on a daily basis. You know, you got stuff coming from all angles, medical, grievance, disciplinary, employees, inmates, um, you know, and, and these admin are responsible, both criminally and civilly, for the care, custody, and control of these offenders, you know, by law. So do they have to care for them? sometimes and it feels like they care for them more than than the staff absolutely however with that said when decisions and choices are made by admin and it's probably one of the reasons why i stayed a lieutenant for 24 out of my 29 years was because of the fact 
that I seen these decisions being made um, without regard to the frontline staff, without informing anybody of why the decisions were made. And I felt like it was my it was my duty as a lieutenant to go to these frontline staff who were disgruntled and upset and, and had these that had this had this persona that, you know, admin doesn't give a fuck about us. You know, you know, the hell with the employees, as long as the offenders are taken care of, it's all that matters. To a degree, yes, it's a truth because we're, we're we're responsible as public servants to make sure that they're healthy, that they're on the count, and that they stay in the fence. And within those topics, there are things that we have to give them. So you know, I I, I understand their feeling, but at the same time, you know, it takes an open line of communication from the top to the bottom, and from the bottom to the top, you know. There were times where I've taken decisions that were made by admin and had to take it and, and, and kind of explain it to the staff and break it down. And then they kind of understand why that decision is made. You know, it, it, it's not easy being an administrator because, you know, once you're, once you're, you know, mid-level management, I, I pretty much, I'm going to say from Lieutenant on up, you're considered mid-level management. Um, you know, you're just not fighting. You're not just fighting the fight with the inmates. You're having to fight the fight with the staff. You're having to fight the fight with the family members. Because, you know, as, as lieutenants, I, I used to get them calls, too, when I was on night shift. You know, we didn't have a duty warden on, after, you know, from 8 to 5. So after after 5 o'clock, you know, the lieutenants were responsible for taking those calls. And, you know, we still had to listen to the family members. You know, we knew 90% of the calls were bullshit because we had just spoken to the offender probably 10 minutes prior. You know, but we still have to go through the motions and give that persona and the perception that we're being unbiased in our decisions, that we're, you know, we're looking at the totality of the circumstances, you know, both inmate and 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 the, the staff member. And, you know, and I tell the family, you know, you got their version, you got the staff's version and somewhere in the middle is the truth. And, and, and that's that's what I look for, you know, regardless of how the outcome is. You know, and, and that's one thing that the staff respected me for because I was fair and firm no matter what. And, you know, but I would also communicate my decisions to the staff. Hey, you know, I know you're pissed off, but, you know, this this is what's this is why I had to make this decision. And, you know, 90 percent of the times the staff would say, you know, Lou, I, I, I understand. I do. You know, um, you know, to say with an absolute that admin cares more about the inmates you know, the per my personal gut feeling is no, but you know, sometimes administration does things that that kind of project that persona because they don't communicate with anybody to let them know what's going on. Right. There, you know, it, if you've got a clear line of communication and you keep staff informed, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter if the administration tells the major, "Hey, major, look, I had to do this. This is why." Major comes down to the lieutenant, "Hey, Lou, I'm just letting you know." You know, some of your bosses are going to be pissed off because, you know, Ward made this decision and, and this is the reason why. And then, you know, when the staff approached me about it, OK, then then I can explain it to them. And a lot of the times it, it's it's explainable to the point where they kind of understand, because once you you know, and, and that's why I, I always harped on the fact that. Whatever job you're in. Keep your people involved. Not only invest in them, but keep them in the loop. Keep them all they, they want the knowledge. They want to know they're a part of that team. And if, if they're able to see that bigger picture at a lower level, they tend to understand more why the decisions are made. But it takes communication. It takes somebody to facilitate that message from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top. You know, because there's been times I'm gone to the warden and say, hey, look, boss, you know, my people are calling fucking foul on this because of, because of what you did. You know, and, and, you know, the warden will go, Joe, sit down. You know, I understand your people are pissed off, but this is what I had to do, and this is why. Right. Okay, warden, all I ask is just a little bit, just a clear line of communication. Even if it's just between me and you, I can facilitate to, I can facilitate that to my staff. But just keep me in the loop so I'm not getting blindsided by my people. But, you know, communication is key. Yeah, but and you make a lot of sense too because I'm going to be honest with you. When there's uh, 
uh, a moment where there is a concern that I feel that once I pass it down, uh, there is going to be an issue with the front line receiving it. I definitely bring everyone up as, uh, you know, the supervisors more so because I can't have everybody in the office, but I bring up the people that are going to lead the initiative. And basically I say, this is the, what, this is what we got to do. Now I'm going to push down the, how you guys tell me how it wants, how you is the best to accomplish this. And then this is why it has to be done. Now, my biggest concern is when I give these people the why, and I give them an effort to tell me how they want to get it done. My biggest concern is how that meeting goes after the meeting we just had. Because I'm hoping that they don't just translate the why, uh, but they also translate the buy-in. Because when I got people investing in the how, I want their commitment. Because at the end of the day, you told me how this is going to work. Absolutely. I'm giving you full support. So at this point here, I expect the buy-in. Now, guys, if you guys want to interject after each point, uh, just go, just interject. We don't have to. I missed the one for Will, but I, I love follow-up. So, like... Uh, usually when I go to keep the dialogue going, just say, Gange, can I comment something with Russ or Joe, whatever it is, because I, I think it's good to keep the dialogue going to make sure we get clarity. Uh, okay, so this one is going to be unique. Um, admin power is absolute. Uh, so I will start off with uh, Russ on this one. So the last one for admin cares more about the inmates, it's three and a half. Because Joe did the bullshit and couldn't commit to one, uh, so 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 now yeah, so now we got the next one, which is admin power is absolute, which basically means we have power over everything. So Russ, you go first, and then we go to uh, Joe, and then Will. Okay, one hundred percent. This one is is a myth, and I can say that with surety because. There have been times where I have seen admin attest this and, uh, you know, uh, they regretted uh, testing it, you know, on me specifically, um, just because, you know, the, someone believes that they have all the power. If you have more knowledge, more persistence and a willingness to put things down on paper, uh, they're going to be, you know, less likely to mess with you under certain circumstances. Again, this particular aspect kind of comes back though a little bit to the first one that we dealt with in that um and that you know there's there's just this uh divide sometimes that is caused by actual incidents and bad things you know have happened between um between me and admin but that doesn't mean that i try and look at everything through a lens of that all the time and um, you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about here in a second when I say, but sometimes there are certain subsets, right, um, in corrections that only have that one lens to look through, union people. And uh, they, can, they can tend to be, you know, very jaundiced and biased about everything that happens with regard to admin. And they can be very deleterious towards establishing lines of communication for those reasons. But uh, I would say that um, I would say that, you know, admin tests this particular um, little nugget here at their own peril because they obviously, you know, they have to answer to the law. They have to answer to politicians. They have to answer to the courts. Um, their power is certainly not absolute. And that's one thing, you know, that we've worked at in this country so hard. Um, you know, is having a constitution both at the federal and state levels like we do to try and split the power amongst everyone as much as possible so that um, no one faction can just do whatever the heck they want. Yeah. So if I I got to feed off on Russ real quick. So I think when I love what you're saying. So obviously, in my mind, it's definitely a myth. I've been an admin now for almost a decade. I, I think people think we have the freedom uh, within our decision making, but actually it's not. We just have authority in more areas to make decisions in. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have the freedom to make whatever decision we want. Uh, also, I feel when it comes to powers, absolute, actually, I think admin is just the opposite because admin has so much authority. We are the ones that wind up being told what to do from above, from around us, from below. Uh, and what I mean by that is, when you have the power, the perceived power to make a decision on something, people will defer to you, whether it's coming down or whether it's coming from across or above. I mean, I can give you an example 
right now where when you oversee this the house and you have the civilian side of the house under your uh, authority, a lot of the times they can't move. And they're going to go to you and say, hey, Gange, I can't move. Can you do A, B, C, D for me? And it's like, oh, shit, now I got to do A, B, C, D. And then you get, you know, maybe medical saying, hey, Gange, I haven't gotten these inmates. Can you get these inmates for me? And it's like, holy crap. Then you get the family or the butch person calling, hey, this inmate's saying this. Can you look into that? And, you know, it, 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 and, and then up top saying, hey, we need this put in. Can you Can you get that done? And it's like, holy crap, like, you know, you're admin and people think that, you know, all we do is delegate. I would say we receive more than we actually delegate. Uh, yes, don't get me wrong. Uh, what we receive could filter into delegation. Uh, but a lot of the time, what happens here is that we wind up having to take more orders than give them. So I would like to say when it comes to admin powers, absolute, uh, and, and I kind of think of the freedom I actually think because of the areas of responsibility, our freedom actually lessen. Uh, again, that, that's, that's just my thought. Uh, okay, so if anybody wants to interject, and if not, we got Joe. What's your thoughts, Joe? Is this a myth? Admin power is absolute. No, that's that's definitely definitely a myth, especially in this today and you know in this age, because you know twenty years ago, admin and and wardens had the the capability and the power of actually running their own units. Uh, Today is pretty much managed by, you know, whatever political divides going on at the moment. You know, you got pressures coming in from from senators, congressmen, family members, you know, it, and, you know, what what little power admin used to have. It, it doesn't seem like they have that power anymore. Um, you know, if we're talking about the balance of power between admin and line staff or, you know, the, the subordinates, uh, you know, it, it's also a myth because of the fact that. You know, we can take away admin and, and the little guys will keep the keep the facility running 24-7. Uh, whereas, you know, you take away the line staff, you really don't have have much there. Um, you know, it's admin. Admin now definitely don't have the power that they used to have. Uh, you know, like I said, 20 years ago, wardens were able to, to make decisions on their own unit without, you know, worries and and re with regard to outside political pressures from, from organizations and, and uh, you know, uh, inmate associations. And, and, you know, that thankfully down here, we don't have to worry about unions. Uh, that's, that's not even part of the, the, the political pie down here. So that's one thing that, you know, I'm thankful for down here. Yeah. I don't have, uh, we have, we have multiple unions where I work. Uh, what do you, what's your thoughts on this? Will? so wait, so far we got three myths. Well, what's your thoughts? Absolute power? Uh, no, absolutely they don't. I mean, if you look at, and I, I may take a little bit of a different twist on this, but, um, you know, administrations come and go and your, it's your, it's your line staff. It's your, you know, every facility has a rank, right. Where that actually has the ability to it's the filter, right? So if you're a, an administrator and you push down something, it's got to get filtered through. Like Joe was talking about, he was that bridge. Well, he can ultimately control that message and put that message out to however he wants. So um, I, I, I think that to say that anybody has absolute power, um, no, I, I'm going to disagree. And I think I think the beautiful thing about this piece here, about this this particular myth, is that line staff can listen and realize that that they are powerful, that they do have a say in the things that happen in their facility, uh, you know, as far as morale goes and, and, and tone goes and being able to speak up for themselves. Um, because uh, and one of the things that that my administrator says is that that you guys don't work for me. I work for you uh, because ultimately, you know, the decisions that they make, I mean, it, all of that filters down to us and it's up to us to carry it out. So I, you know, I, I think this is definitely without beating the dead horse. I agree with everybody. Uh, their power is not absolute. Um, corrections on every level is a team sport and it takes all of us to carry out the correctional objectives. So, um, so no myth. Yeah. And guys, just to let you know, the first time I realized this was really a myth, is obviously in custody when I started in early 2000s, 2002, whatever it was, uh, we were trained under authority compliance, you know, chain, chain of command, whatever it is. But then when I got into administration um, and, and having to oversee the civilian side, 
uh, they question more. You know, they they they're not as easy to just say, hey, get this done. You got to work with them a little bit more because, you know, they got perspectives that they want to put out there. And and again, you're also they have uh, their areas of expertise. You know, they're coming in with these college degrees. And, you know, sometimes if, if just like I had to learn, even with, with custody too, guys, the, you guys are the experts on the front line. So to be honest with you, my job as a leader is to delegate you the authority and the power. So I love what William said. I'm okay with me saying, hey, I work for you guys. So what do you need me to do? Because I want my house to be ran bottom up. So um, I think if you if admin is seen as having absolute power and there is an admin that embraces it, you're leading all wrong. Your objective is to delegate that power out, delegate that authority, let that house run automatic and you remove yourself from the process. Um, okay, so that's going to be four minutes uh, because it looks like Joe made a decision on that one. Yay, okay, Joe. Joe. Good, job. Good job, Joe. Good job. All right. So <laughs> now this one's going to start with Joe. So, so Joe, you're going to originate this thought one. You ready? Here, here we go, Joe. Admins are just Monday night quarterbackers. <laughs> oh, that's a hard one, Joe. That's a hard one, man. Oh, man. You talk about turning me bipolar, <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> uh I'll 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 go with I'll go with myth on this one. Um because of the fact that you know when when incidents happen, when things happen, you know, um you know, some of your admin are quick to pull the pull the trigger and uh and, and say that, you know, this happened for this reason without, you know, actually knowing the full scope of, of what took place. You do have some admin um, that, you know, not only looking at civil issues or, you know, actually the ones that care about the people underneath them and, and don't want to see anybody get jammed up will do a methodical job of, of making sure that, you know, that, that the situation went down the way it should have and that, you know, that everybody's good. Um, do we have those type, those type admins that are, that are quick on the trigger? Um, absolutely. Um, we do, you know, and I've worked for a few of them that, you know, they were so afraid of, of getting pressure from above them from you know, either the regional director's office or executive director's office, um, that they were quick to pull that disciplinary trigger. Um, without really knowing the full scope of everything that took place. Um, do I think all of them fall into that category? No, because you generally have, you know, supervisors and you, you do have some admin that, that truly care about their staff and look for the greater good in people when looking at incidents versus, you know, looking for the, 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 the worst of the worst in a situation first. And I, I think that truly matters, you know, in being an admin, you know, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be quick to, to to pull the trigger on on an incident without knowing the full scope, um, just because you're afraid of what may come down from above you. I mean, it's your job to take heat. That, that that's what you're there for. Um, we're obviously not there to take heat for you know dirty bosses or, or or bosses that committed criminal offenses during a use of force or something like that. Obviously, we're not gonna we're not gonna cover for them on that. Um, but we are there to take heat for our staff. Um, that, that is our job. At least it's, you know, it's my job. At least it was my job, um, as a Lieutenant. I did it all the time. Um, you know, we had them, the, the administrators above me that were, you know, write them all up and let God sort them out type individuals. No, we're not fixing to do that. You know, and I've, I've, I've taken disciplinaries in my career for that because of that. And, and I'll take them all day long, but you know, we're not going to, we're not going to instantly march into a situation without knowing all the facts. And you're going to tell me to start writing these folks up for this, this, and this, when, you know, you don't even have all the complete information. Um, I'll call foul on that every time, but do I think all the admins fall into that category? No. I mean, you truly really have some admin, like I said, that will, that will, that actually look at the totality of the situation and, and care about the staff for the greater good, you know, as long as it's not something that's criminal or, or, or civil. What about if I change it to say admins are Monday night quarterbackers? Would you say that's a myth or truth? If I got rid of the word just. No, I, I'd still call it a myth, you know, with okay. some, with, with, with some, you know, cause you'll have some people, <laughs> 
fall into that category regardless. You know, you can, you take that two o'clock in the morning call. I'm your lieutenant. And I'm telling you that we just had a riot. Two of my bosses have been assaulted. I got three inmates in the hospital. Um, you know, you're not just going to say, OK, what the fuck did the bosses do to, to start this riot? Right. You know, you're going to ask about the whole situation. What happened? What led up to this? What were we doing? What was going on at the time? You know, right. first, you know, the first, you know, how are my officers, you know, type type situation? Then how are my inmates? Um, but, you know, it, not everybody's going to fall into that, Anthony. Not 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 everybody's going to be in that. You know, you'll have some in, in both situations. Right. So, so, right. So when I said the word just, I think I limited us. I, I shouldn't have put the word just. I mean, so when I say admins are Monday night quarterbackers, the reason why I'm going to say it's a truth is let me apologize. It shouldn't have the word just in there because we're more than just that. Uh, so with that said, the reason why I'm saying it's a truth is only because it's our job. You know, when stuff happened the night before, we have to all get together at a briefing and start cleaning stuff up. Now, when we ask questions, the questions that we're asking shouldn't be questions of judgment, but rather questions of curiosity. Hey, what happened last night? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I see this on the daily recap. Uh, you know, um, why did the officer do this? A, B, C, D. Now, the sad thing is in our effort to find clarity, uh, we may ask a question and then it may get translated as we're passing judgment. And, oh, here comes admin trying to get at me again. It's like, no, admin's trying to make every packet look really pretty. Because at any moment, this could get passed up and, you know, you never know. And one inmate could just, that incident may seem nothing to you, winds up being in a, a lawsuit five years later. And all you have that you really remember by is that beautiful packet that admin and the team uh, was able to kind of, you know, do what they were supposed to do to make it presentable. Uh, usually part of that team would be admin, the investigative division, uh, you know, the maybe the classification department when it comes to placement. But I think that we do have a role in Monday night quarterbacking. And I do think that the questions we ask are not because we're looking to come at you, but we're looking for clarity. And by the way, clarity doesn't mean certainty. You know, it, it doesn't mean certainty. It just means that we got to paint a picture. That's all it is that later on uh, we could present if need be. So uh, I, I, I do think we do play a role as Monday night quarterbackers. And unfortunately, uh, it's not a role that's well received. But if I could just say it one more time, we, we ask questions because we should be curious to figure out what happened. And not because, like Joe said, we're going to judge you right off the bat without even knowing uh, what your uh, perspective was. Um, OK, so let's go to Will. What's your thought, Will? Is this a myth or a truth? No, I wrote down, I wrote down fact. Um, I think it's a truth. I think that, I, I think that the term Monday night quarterback or Monday morning quarterback has a kind of a negative connotation because it usually means people that have no idea what they're doing are questioning, uh, the things that, that happened the day before. And like you said, it, it is their job. Uh, it is administrator's job to question. And, and, and here's, so here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say it's a fact because they, they they have to. It's part of their job. And um, I like what Joe said, that the time to do that is not, you know, the example you gave, Joe, is, hey, I made the phone call. Shit's going crazy. You know, OK, what's going on? Is everybody OK? That's not Monday morning yet. That's halftime. That's you're in the middle of it. You're in the throes of it. Now, everybody knows that the executive team is going to comb over this thing now for the next three months. And the reason is they're trying to keep everybody out of trouble. They're trying to make sure all the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, everybody followed policy, because if any of you have ever sit in a grand jury, it's rather uncomfortable. And you want to make sure that all of that paperwork is right, that you knew exactly what you were doing. So I think that here, Ed administration does need to be Monday night quarterbacks. They do need to look over those things. And, and then we, our part is we need to understand that, that some of that is being done to protect us being when you work in corrections, you're going to be questioned for your actions. Part of our job requires us to apply force to other human beings, to get them to do the things that we need them to do. 
somebody's going to ask you a question about that. And it's not because they're questioning your integrity. It's not because they, they think that you automatically did something that you're not supposed to. Cause we, a hundred percent of people in my facility were body cameras. And so there is no question. We, you, you have it, you have audio, you have video, you have all of that. They just want to make sure that you're able to articulate what happened, why you did what you did. So when some crazy attorney asks you nine months, 15 months later, all your ducks in a row. And let me add this in there, Anthony. I think all of us should be Monday morning quarterbacks in the, in the aspect that we look at a situation, we look at a use of force, we look at an interaction we had with an individual, and then we go back and we replay that and we say, with all of the information that we have now, did we handle that appropriately? Is there anything else that we could have done? It's, 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 and, and I think we do that, right? I think line staff then goes back and, and looks at, and we talk about it, but we do it kind of negative. We say, well, did you hear what happened in Russ's unit? Yeah, Russ is this, and Russ doesn't do his rounds. And, and, and if I was in there, that shit wouldn't have happened, but blah, blah, blah. We, we do that, right? And, and I think that's because human beings do that. But if we, if we take a time to sit down and talk and get the facts and then say, okay, yeah, Russ, his situation went this way. These are the decisions that he made with my skill set, with my experience, with my abilities. Are there different things that I could do that would have affected that outcome? We should be doing that all the time uh, when when situations happen. That's what helps us elevate our game. That's what helps us be, get all this experience. Everybody on this call has got decades of correctional experience because we 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 keep learning, we keep processing, we keep working through the things that we're doing. And so so yes, it it is part of their job, but maybe that's a part of the job that that line staff that we should mirror. Um, uh, to get better at what we do. So that's my take. That's my hot take. No, that was spot on. I learned something too, real quick. A lot of uh -oh. stuff there. But so it's Monday morning quarterbacking, not Monday night. I, 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 I when I Googled it, it says Monday morning quarterback, ah! but, there, but there is Monday night football. So I, well, it should be Tuesday morning quarterbacking. I, 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 guess. I, I, I had it all fucked up. I thought that the game was on okay. Sunday, then you go to work on Monday, and then at night you look at the shit. And that's that, and that's what it is. But but I mean, are you are you a football guy? I don't even know if you no, watch football, do you? I don't. No. I don't watch. Football, no. Okay. Man, yeah, so. yeah. But uh, get a pass. But, but I love. What, there was a perspective that you said that I really loved. I don't know if Russ would cross into that a little bit when he goes. But I like the fact that you said that front line Monday uh, should be Monday morning quarterbacking too. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, because there is stuff that you learn uh, from. I guess the the trials and errors from the night before. Um, what's your, what's your right. thoughts on that, Russ? That, that was a pretty cool perspective. And you're muted, Russ. Oh. Yes. Okay. Now I'm no longer. I just, I, okay. I just want to, I want to mention one thing. You're an embarrassment to the rehabilitation <laughs> services. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've been hoping to achieve. <laughs> So, so anyway, I, I, I really, I really liked, um, you know, what, what everyone has, has said in this, I wanted to like, kind of like, um, do a little bit of uh, devil's advocate on this though, and look at it a little bit differently. But then I, but then I realized that what I was coming up with is just perhaps um, a little bit more nuanced. Um, it's easy to look and say, Oh, you know, they're just Monday morning quarterbacking us. And, um, you know, especially, you know, if we have that type of uh, supervisor, admin, whatever, that's looking at from that perspective, as Will brought up, uh, well, you know, this is what I would have done, or why did they do it that way? That's not the way that I would have done it. And they start bringing in, you know, their own little, uh, you know, personal, uh, you know, confirmation biases about these people are not up to uh, the same type of uh, professionalism that I am or was when I was in their position, which is inherently unfair. But I've seen that a number of times. So I kind of look at this as, well, what's going on when we say this? Are these people doing what they should be doing, which is giving us an objective review, not Monday morning quarter, but an objective review on the facts versus a subjective judgment based on a lens of um, confirmation bias where we just assumed that what happened was wrong. 
And so I think that that's um, so I think that's kind of where we have to try it and look and see the difference between we're doing this. And now, you know, we'll talk some about, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, after action review, but after action review is a little bit different because we're more talking about how we could have been more effective, what went right, what went wrong, and less about whether or not we were in compliance. Can and I so I think that, Wait, Russ, can I ask yeah. you a question about something you said? Uh, and yeah. then again, uh, you know, but let me ask you a question. So when you're reviewing it, as administration, whatever it is, you're also reviewing it with the bias of what's expected to have been accomplished. So what would be good advice? Because I think you were spot on with something, but I really would like to get your advice on this. How do you not let those needed expectations affect you uh, when someone is taking it uh, to the left a little bit? Well, I, I think that we have to whatever is going on in the review, the type of review that it is, is, is really important. Um, a lot of times the review is whether or not, you know, we're in compliance. Are we in compliance with um, a policy? Are we in compliance with procedure? Are we in compliance with state law? Are we in compliance with case law? Are we in compliance with federal law? And that's a whole different subject from whether or not we are um, doing things that are, you know, tactically sound, um, in a way that uh, we're able to be effective, you can blow something tactically, but still be, um, you know, within the bounds of compliance on what's expected uh, by the law and policy and procedure. And so I think that um, I think that sometimes there are, you know, some administrators that aren't nuanced enough to realize that this is a really important thing. Um, it's one thing for us to sit back after, you know, a big riot and go, okay, guys, this is the time. Let's do the after action review. What did we do right? What did we do wrong? How could we have been more effective? Um, is there anything that we really need to take uh, you know, under advisement with regard to safety and security? Do we need to change our procedures? Do we need to rewrite procedures? That's a totally different question um, than whether or not we were in compliance and our use of force was good and all of these other things. Because you're always going to be able to find fault with tactics and or perhaps even even strategy, whereas it's not necessarily um, where it's not necessarily as uh, important as making sure that you were in compliance with those other things and knowing that, hey, we crossed all of our T's, we dotted all of our I's and we're good with this as far as compliance goes. Maybe not so much as far as, you know, tactics and other things where we made mistakes, but these are different questions. And I think the nuance lies in as to, you know, what lens we're looking through at what time, at what time with them, if that makes uh, sense. I, I think I love that. I don't think that question has ever been answered like that before. I thought that was spot on. And I think for people that are looking at this from admin, uh, they really need, I think that the advice that you just gave was for management. Right. 100%. Now, uh, if anyone doesn't have nothing to interject, I will go to the next one. I think this one's the most controversial out of them all. And Can we'll I just say that I'm I'm right I'm ahead. spending most of my time Googling the big words that Russ is using uh, uh, just yeah. to make sure I know what the hell he, he is. You you're I could he's a needs to teach a master class because this I could listen to Russ all day. But yeah, so yeah, I'm, he, I'm, he's got it like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I, re, I remember. Thank you, Will. Was, Listen, I remember when Russ first came on my show back in 2012 when we did it for iHeartRadio, and I never knew what Russ looked like because on his facial profile for Facebook, it was just a guy in a blue shirt holding like a fucking manufactured weapon. But I didn't know what he what he uh, looked like. I think the first time I saw what Russ looked like was when I finally met him in Vegas in like whatever that was, 2017. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely Russ is supposed to be writing a book on complacency, but where is it, Russ? Um, huh? I I'll tell you what, if, if I would if I would quit having family disasters happening, that would be great. All right, wait, yeah. way to lower the way to lower the mute on uh, on humor there, Russ. We were all joking, and now we all feel and now it's all somber and everything yeah, else. I'll somber. lighten it up, okay? Yeah. Just, hey, so this one to me may be the most controversial. Will you are gonna you are scheduled to go first on this uh, one? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, and I think this one is the hardest one uh, out of the ones that we did. Uh, and I'll just put it out there. Admin needs custody experience. Is that a myth or a truth? And by the way, the last one was, mm. uh, hey, Russ, did you, for the last one, at, uh, 
Monday night quarterbacks. Was that a myth or a truth? You you said that was a myth. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, go rogue and say that that's a myth. Okay. So that means that's two, two then for that one. So you and Joe both went with the myth. Okay. And then me and Will went with the truth. Okay. So now this one is admin needs custody experience. All right. This one's a tough one. Will go ahead, brother. I feel like, I feel like you're setting me up on this one. Um, (laughs) Because, because I can, I can, Listen, I have I have said this a uh, ten thousand times in my life. I'm not even going to pretend that I haven't. Um, but uh, it, the the reality is, administration doesn't need actual experience to be the figurehead of your facility. What they need to do, though, is surround themselves with people who know what they're talking about. And so, uh, would it be nice if uh, you know? your director or your warden knew what it was like to be grabbed through a, a food port to know just the anxiety and the feeling of carrying the keys and walking through a sea of people who don't want you to be there and, and, and hate what you represent. You know, would it be nice for, you know, your director to have been punched in the face once or twice in their life? Uh, yeah, it, it would be. And, and I, but I don't know if that is the, the cornerstone that would make your administrator, you know, uh, the, the best fit in your eyes, because, and, and, and let me say this corrections is, is evolving. The way that people do jail and prison is changing. And the, a good balance is, um, education experience is, is, you know, understanding, you know, program and rehabilitation versus, you know, having that security mindset. It's that perfect blend that you need. And, you know, the, the danger becomes, um, I've seen it bad, bad and good both ways, right? Like a a guy rises up through the ranks and is running the jail and he's, he's just one focus and, you know, you still have just that experience and you, you know, you talk about absolute power, you know, this is how we're going to do it because this is how I do it. And this is how I have done it. A, a lot of the meetings that we sit in, right. Are like, well, you know, we, for 35 years, we've done it this way. Well, that way is not working anymore because we have a different population of people. So I would say that, that no administrators to be effective leaders, to be good motivators of men and women and staff don't need to have necessarily walked in my shoes. However, they need to read The Prince by Machiavelli. They need to understand that they have to surround themselves with people that have been in my shoes that do know what they're talking about. So when they come up with a policy or they want to do some sort of initiative, they understand how it's going to affect staff. And, and, And so it's not always about having the right answer but knowing where to find that answer, I think is the key. And so, so I'm going to say, I'm going to say myth on this one. I know people are rolling their eyes and probably going to pitch forks and torches and all that shit, but um, no, I, I just think you need to have the proper cabinet, the proper cadre of people around you uh, to, to be a successful leader, because if, 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 if they don't look good, you don't look good. All right. So let me not leave William floating in the water there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, because I'm going to agree with Will on everything he said, and I'm not going to be like Rose and not give you a chance to come on to the board. We could share this fucking thing. Together. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're both going to drown on this one. So I, I've shifted as well. Uh, when I was custody and all I knew was custody, uh, I expected that to be translated where, you know, the people in administration really had to see my perspective and only my perspective when. Uh, you cross into administration, you realize that you oversee so many different areas uh, of responsibility that, I mean, technically what we want from administration is really to be more open-minded to even experiences that they aren't necessarily familiar with. Because one of my areas could be medical, but I've never been a nurse. I've never been a doctor. Um, You know, so having said that, I think for, for me, I think that if you're able to showcase care, be that advocate uh, for the department you represent, uh, that's the that's the first thing that they need. Will said two things uh, that was really just above and beyond spot on. 
was one, when you move up to the administrative level, even when you just start moving up to the supervisory levels, but definitely on the administrative level, it's less tactical, less technical and, and, and more people management. So if I surround myself by all these resources I think if I go in with too much experience, I wind up micromanaging my experts who are, are the ones now that are leading the way. So granted, you know, here I am as admin and I'm so stuck in my ways and I'm, I'm micromanaging my area of expertise. And then I got my majors like, what the hell am I here for? So I, I think the hardest thing for admin sometimes is to let go of those areas of expertise and delegate that to the, per the people that are supposed to have it. When you're an admin, you are given the best resources. Like Will said, you got the resources to solve any problem, to uncover any problem. I mean, when you become admin, the state should give you all the people that you need to figure out what the hell is going on in your facility. So the last thing I want to do uh, is to, and I, I'm going to be, I'm going to give you a little fail safe for admin too. If I decide, let's say the custody role, and let's say I do have majors and I decide, nope, I, you know, I, I know more than my own majors do. So I'm going to start making my own decisions. Liability is going to fall directly on me. My majors are my cushion. My majors are my experts. Right. Oh, let's be honest, guys. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. if, if, if I'm deciding to make, uh, you know, to, to make all these initiatives without filtering it through my custody experts, they don't care if I was whatever in the past. I'm not serving in that role now. You know, why did I defer to the security major? Well, I'm admin and, you know, I, I, I over, no, no. But you didn't go through the security major. I mean, they're the ones that are closest, you know, closer than you to the ground. You know, I mean, I mean, that's another thing, guys. As you move up, uh, you remove yourself a little further and further from uh, what the people are going through. So, So having said that, when you make a decision up top, Look how many layers uh, you're avoiding that actually translate the, the problem and the concern uh, up and down. So, again, if I'm on the front line, you get all these layers. Each layer has, uh, you know, a bit less knowledge of what's happening on the floor before. Uh, so now I here I am as admin. I'm just throwing stuff down there without even fucking knowing what's happening. Right. Just throwing it. Right. But if I go to a major, the major goes to ten. And so I, I, I love what I love what uh, Will said. I agree. So again, from my perspective, I believe it's a myth. I believe that uh, I just want administration that's open minded, uh, uh, cares for the staff as well, but really knows how to manage people and understand their resources that they could fall back on. So now let's go to Russ because I have a feeling Russ is going to go the other way. You're muted again, Ross, and for a reason, because you are <laughs> going to go the other way. No, okay, go ahead. Now I can change. Now I can change my mind. No, um, okay. So, um, in, in me uh, looking at this, I just have to say no. I I think that um, admin uh, does need uh, people um, that have true custody experience. Um, you know the things that I've seen here, you know, in in Kami, California, as it were, um, you know, has only strengthened that. You know, I've seen you know our department um, go from you know uh, relatively you know high level people, especially at that director slot, down to some really rather you know milk toast um, directors and doctors and and lawyers that um, you know have effectively you know cut off any leadership. And, you know, it's been very destructive to the department. Um, they obviously don't have uh, the talent that they tend to um, excel in is that of politics. Um, you know, you, you saw, you know, way back where, uh, you know, and CDCR got really bad at this, you know, just putting, you know, functionaries in those high level positions, whereas like the California Highway Patrol, um, they were up until recently. And I don't know all the ins and outs of the Highway Patrol. So. But I will tell you that, you know, they were very dedicated towards always having someone who was an actual law enforcement officer um, at the head of their at the head of their department. And then when you look at what has happened nationwide, um, you know, not even not even looking at just the law enforcement aspects, but some things is just putting functionaries in charge of highly specialized things, you know, and without elaborating um, too much, but definitely mentioning you know, a couple of uh, names and whatnot, um, you know, like you look at, okay, Department of Transportation, 
Buttigieg, all right, Director of Homeland Security, Mayorkas. Look at what we're experiencing now due to lack of leadership, lack of skills in those highly skilled professions. So um, some of the things that I've experienced at a little bit lower levels than that was, you know, seeing a secretary who went through the academy and, uh, you know, passed everything in the academy and then came to an institution that I know of that I'm not going to mention. And then as soon as she got there, they pinned on captain's bars. You know, and so there's a disconnect in the expectations of why is this person serving in this capacity um, when they didn't necessarily earn it. And this has been something that's been structured with regards to politics rather than profession. And so I think that um, I think we're being done a disservice by just deciding that, you know, uh, anyone is able to be in these areas where life and de death decisions are being made, where, uh, you know, we have these huge responsibilities with regards to, uh, you know, use of force, care of the inmates and things like that. And so I think that the professional class overall has suffered and, um, and not just at those higher levels, but I mean, the types of people that we're hiring now that uh, would not have been hired in the past because they can't meet the same standards that I met when I came through it. So that's my thoughts on it. No, I, 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 I yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Will. Let me, I, I, Ross, I think another mistake that we're making is I've seen a lot of correctional facilities uh, have former police and sheriffs, uh, deputies, police officers, uh, you know, running their correctional facilities because they think that it's the same thing and it's not, it's two different worlds. And so, you know, I think that we're, you know, people are saying, well, you know, my, my administration, uh, was a, you know, mental health professional. My administration came from this. Well, but you also, some of them are having a, uh, you know, a, a police officer who spent, you know, years on the street and then moved up through the ranks there, but it, it's too, it's still a different world. I mean, it's, it's, it's close and maybe there's some similarities, but I've, I've talked to a lot of officers that have a frustration as well with, yeah, I understand that guy was a sheriff. I understand that guy was a police officer. That guy was a police officer, but she still doesn't know what we go through on a daily basis. So I, I think that, I think that again, whoever you put in, in place, right. It, and you hit on it, you surround yourself with the people that know what's going on, you know? And so a good administration would have, you know, Russ, you would, you would be, if I was running a jail, Russ, you'd be my captain of security. I would bring you on. I would say, you know, you, you're, you're over special teams. You're do, cause I know what your expertise is. I would, I would rely heavily on the things that you say. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that's what's important. But, but I just wanted to point that out that just because they were in law enforcement, does it mean that they can run a jail or a prison as well? Right. I'll, I'll, I'll say this, and this is, this is kind of a, a two edged uh, sword on this. My feeling and, and uh, through the things that I've experienced is, is that people that come from outside the law enforcement stream, um, justifiably so in some cases, feel like um, they are not going to get the backing that they need. So rather than uh, surround themselves with people that have the true expertise, mm. they surround themselves with yes men. Mm. That's been my experience. And I'm, I'm hard pressed to say, you know, my experience is, is limited, of course, but that's what I see. And I think I have a little bit of insight into that. But I think that that's something we have to we have to talk about and discuss because, you know, and sometimes rightfully so that they would be not necessarily ostracized but there would be resistance because they're an unknown quantity. If, if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. I, I, I have seen in my experience and then we'll go to Joe real quick uh, with, with the got to get Joe's opinion on this, but I wanted to mention something. So I I've been in administration for I got close to a decade now, and I've worked under many different administrators and I think there's relevance to both points, but I, I can tell you something I saw in my experience that I don't know if it could be generalized out, but I did see it with two of the people that I worked directly for. And I've worked under a lot of uh, administrators, um, especially, you know, over 10 years, they kind of, you know, move around a little bit. But when I find that 
there are uh, individuals that do have that civilian perspective uh, and they don't and they're kind of afraid to make decisions in the security world, they could over rely on the majors or on the, mm. uh, the heads of security. And now the problem is the rehabilitative side can't function. Uh, you know, the, the medical side uh, can't move either. So I, I, when I look at these scenarios, I, I think for me, because uh, I also want to see it from, you know, Russ's perspective as well, uh, I, I believe that the key here uh, in my my thing is is to really have an open minded individual surrounded by good people who will lead them where they need to be. And all they have to do is kind of encourage good discussion and then make a decision that could be informed uh, through the experts who technically lead the way. Because I'm the adverse of that. And as I mentioned before, I have seen people that take extreme pride in coming from custody but but so much pride that they now uh, step on other people's toes. And now the problem is, is that they're making decisions uh, where they really shouldn't be at that point. They should be leaving that to their experts and their job will then be to support the decision. So this could be more of an individualized um, concern. Uh, but having said that, we got two for myth, one for truth. Joe, what do you got? Mm. Man, while y'all were talking, I had to smoke a cigarette just because. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm not going to be nowhere near as politically correct as, as Russ was. And I'm just going to put it straight out. You're goddamn right. They need custody experience. The reason why our penitentiaries are in the shape that they're in now is because of these cut and paste wardens that were putting in place with no friggin' experience. And it doesn't matter to me, it doesn't matter who you surround them with. If you can't understand what these people that you're surrounded with are explaining to you, you got no friggin' business being there. You're a liability. Um, you know, we're we're in a junction now where we're taking we're taking college degrees over experience. And I I, I think that's utter bullshit. You know, one of my one of my captain's boards I went up on, the question was experience or college degrees, what do you prefer and why? Um, you know, you can have all the college degrees in the world, but if you don't have the experience and the common sense to go with it, you're still dumb as a stump. Um, you know, just because somebody and, and, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with what uh, William said about, you know, the law enforcement side of it. You know, just because you bring somebody in from the law enforcement side doesn't mean that they can run a, a jail or, or institution. And I've seen it firsthand. I've seen them promote hospital administrators from a healthcare system to senior warden just because they have the experience in, 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 in managing multiple people and they've come to a unit and turned it into a total friggin' train wreck, even with the people trying to explain to them what's going on. And, you know, they're the ultimate authority. They're the ultimate signature for that facility. And when you have incidents take place, you know, they're the final, they're, they're one of the final signatures. And if they can't comprehend, what the people are trying to explain to them. I, to me, it, it, it's just a liability more than it is a, it's more of a hindrance than it is a help. Um, you know, I've seen them, I've, I've seen a police dispatcher getting that promoted. She was in the, in the academy and got promoted out of the academy to Lieutenant with no experience only because she worked for a law enforcement agency. Again, total friggin' train wreck. Right. Just because just because you have the college degrees does not make you a damn leader. It doesn't mean you know the inside of a penitentiary. It doesn't it doesn't mean you know how a penitentiary works. You know, just the same if you were to take a, a, a true warden who came up through security and you yanked him out of there and you put him in a you put him in a hospital and, and told him to run this hospital. Granted, you got people around you that you're surrounded by telling you, you know, we need to do this, 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 and this, and, and you're sitting behind the desk and you can't comprehend why the hell we're doing what we're doing. You're not going to do them a, 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 a service either. So why the hell would we do the same thing to the prison system? And, and I love what you're saying, Joe, but, I, but I'll just, so we got two for two. Uh, if I could just say one thing. So obviously with admin, you're, you should be surrounded with 
uh, a team we mentioned, but even admin itself, you may have one person that has a custody background, then their support uh, admin could be uh, whatever, classification, rehabilitation. But when it comes to safety and security, uh, I kind of look at where all the liability is. So, okay, safety and security obviously is paramount. We know that. But safety and security also comes with proper classification. Uh, so having someone that has a classification background could also be uh, a very good use in a high level position because classification is a very now that we have seen position. I have seen I have seen chiefs chiefs of classifications get promoted to wardens, but the majority of them have some sort of security experience, and that's well, yeah, I, I, it also comes with classification. So I, I've seen that happen. I've yeah, because you got to you got to understand the, obviously the layout of the facility. But I think I think where it matters is knowing that at any moment liabilities could shift priorities could shift you know preservation of life being paramount so i think when it when it comes to uh who runs the house i think they also got to understand where liabilities can be and the best way to do that is when you're able to listen to each department and then kind of understand at that point, okay, hey, guys, this is about the preservation of life. You know, what do you mean that you kept the individual handcuffed? Why uh, the doctors were saying, hey, we got to unhandcuff them. You know, we got to, you know, so I, I think that there is a balance in decision making that I expect from my person at the highest level. And I will tell you one thing right now, the people that have been the best leaders, some of them have a custody background, but you would never know it. Because they 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 let their people do the job, so I think if you got like if you promote someone uh, in, in an effort to showcase that custody experience, then what happens is they could wind up also holding the facility back to some extent, just like any other department could be. If I hire someone that wants to run the facility solely based on their rehabilitation experience, and when they go on that position, they expect that, well, I've been picked for this for this, so I'm going to go crazy and start implementing things, then all of a sudden it's like we lose out on the safety and security thing. I think I think the advice would be here is that, remember, your experience is a look backwards, but you're being hired for your potential. So having said that, when I bring you up to this high level position, I need you to view this house in an objective fashion in which all things run smoothly and we're not one that creates an obstacle for each other. So again, I, I just feel that if you go in too heavy and they showcase the fact that you are custody and this is you know what you're about and this is why you were brought into this position, then the house itself is going to translate into that house. And I don't know if that's always going to be totally beneficial. I guess it truly does depend on the house you're running. And that's well, one last thing I want to add. And then I don't, well, you may have a thought. I, I got, I got something. I, I, and I think Joe, I think what Joe says has incredible value because he is echoing uh, uh, tens of thousands of correctional officers opinions. So what I'll say is this, is that as a profession, we do a shitty job of promoting education and experience because that's the key right education and experience and, it, and if we're saying and the majority of us are saying no you you need correctional experience you need the the reality is a lot of a lot of uh you know boards and stakeholders and people who are hiring these high level leaders they are looking at the education background they are looking at some other things other than experience so what if we did this what if we told our correctional staff in the beginning, hey, we're going to need you to lead this profession into the future. And so to do that, to be considered, uh, we want you to continue your education, get as much training as you can to position yourself so you can be the warden, you can be the director, you can be the leader moving forward, and then you'll have, uh, you know, this is one of my kind of my pet peeves, right? Is, is that if you don't have the, the training department that you want, if you don't have the FTOs that you don't, if you want, that you want, if you don't have the leadership that you want, then put yourself in a position to be that person, right? Go back to school, go back to training, uh, you know, uh, get to know the people you need to get to know to whatever it is. But I agree. I think if, if the question is what makes the best, leader in my opinion my perfect like euphoric thing is what anthony said i have custody background but you wouldn't know it i i i i have educated myself 
I have the experience. I've served the food trays and I've done the time in the classroom to learn as much as I can. And so what I'll, what I'll tell frontliners while you're, while you're, you know, yelling and, 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 and complaining that your, that your leader is not who you want them to be, then maybe you have to be that person. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have to step up and be that person. And, uh, and then that would be great. And then you can come on and you can lead the next generation of people. Um, if you don't see the change that you want, you got to be the change. Not to be cliche, but that's what it is. Yeah, that's uh, what is that? Mahatma Gandhi. And, 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 and I want to add one more thing before we get to the next one is that also depends on the house you run. Like there are there may be certain houses that are going to be custody driven because they are high level maximum security housing. And, you know, they may want to have someone that has a relationship or an understanding uh, towards how that needs to be because the primary function of this house is really safety and say like Florence, Colorado, you know, stuff like that. But then I, you know, I've worked in five different facilities, uh, mostly max, but I did have a quick seven months at a program facility for sex offenders where it was a program ran facility um, and safety and security. I'm not going to say play a, a subordinate role, but they played a supportive role. You know, it was a facility that was not code driven. It was a facility that pretty much the people do their programming and uh, eventually they go. But but again, custody is always going to have a primary function. But in this case here, they were a supportive role because programming was the priority. And then you also have drug treatment facilities that are state prisons. And at that point there, you know, yes, safety and security is a primary function always. But the goal of this facility is 100 percent treatment. So now the person running that facility mm -hmm. may not be good to be that custody person, maybe a support function. Yes. But maybe the person I want at the top of that one is someone that knows how to get these programs moving and, and then work with custody. Uh, but I, I've seen it guys just to be on both sides. So, so we know is I have seen always resistant from both sides, but I have seen where it's easier sometimes when there's a concern for custody, just to stop everything. And even when it's not needed, and then just basically say, hey, guys, sorry, well, my lights went out. Hey, guys, uh, we couldn't do anything today uh, because, um, I don't know, we had a, a medical code. So we locked down the whole compound. And then you're going to have someone from the program side, like, why are we locking the compound down for a medical code? You know, we got to get these programs done. Then you have the back and forth. And sometimes, sadly, because <laughs> it could be easier to not run programs because it's safer for custody staff sometimes. You know, you need someone on the on the program side to advocate a little more and saying, hey, guys, why are we shutting the whole compound down for medical? You know, why, why are we not continuing to run the programs and stuff like that? So I think it, it does require overall someone who's surrounded by the experts, but is open minded at top. But I so far for yeah. that, we had two and two. Mm. Yeah, let me, let me just get, get back to um, to one thing that uh, William said real quick. I do. I do like the idea about, you know, having something in place, you know, something in writing, something formal. Um, if we're talking about, you know, upward mobility, I think that um, I think that could be key toward allaying, um, you know, a lot of these, you know, fears about, you know, hey, who is taking over? Uh, you know, it's just uh, I think that there's just a feeling that, you know, hey, someone's being paid off. Um, someone's, you know, getting their their just dues from uh from a political standpoint rather than you know having been you know blooded in through the system and and brought up through the ranks and really you know earning the respect of you know inmates and staff alike and so i think that that's a very very good point by by william and that's something i would yeah. like to really truly see more of you know that's actually worthy of a whole topic uh one day if we yes. want to get to another it, topic. it could be all right, so let's see. That crossed out that one. I think we did good. So again, that was two to two. Now, this is going to start with Russ first. Uh, we'll try to speed through these now a little bit. Um, Russ, admin is quick to discipline. Is that a myth or a fact? Oh, so hard. Okay, once again, this is one of those things where there's uh, often a difference between the specifics and the generalizations, um, but you know, having having been on the receiving end a couple of times justly, 
but many, many, many more times unjustly, I'm going to say, I'm going to say true. Uh, but from a standpoint of, uh, you know, who's using it, you know, as, as part of their, um, agenda. And when I say agenda, I mean, um, you know, carrying out a little bit of, you know, uh, personal get back or just, you know, kind of, um, you know, they maybe don't like the type of officer you are. So I think that sometimes they can be very, you know, quick on the trigger. I think other times they can be slower, but being used um, because I've, I mean, I've actually seen this. This is this is not some bullshit. I've actually seen them, you know, set people up. So um, I reluctantly, reluctantly say that that's true. Um, but I do think, you know, um, I do think that in a lot of cases, you know, the, the um, judgments that are rendered, the fact finders that are done are done in a good way, but it only takes a little bit of stink to smell up the whole system. And, uh, and it's been my, my personal, it's been my personal experience to have been targeted um, in a method that was uh, not just fair or legal. And so, um, and so naturally I'm going to be a little bit jaundiced toward that section of, you know, what our, um, of, you know, what our profession does especially with regard to internal affairs. So I, and, I hope that, I hope that makes sense, but no, it, it makes sense on the extreme side, because obviously I've seen people that have done cases and when they put so much resources into a case and they find out it's not where they want it to be. Uh, sadly, some may unfortunately bias that case, if you will. Um, but, but I want to mention something. So for, for me, I'm going to say it's a myth. Uh, and again, I'm not leaning on the extreme here, uh, but I do get Russ's point. But the reason why I'm going to say it's a myth is uh, there's liability, right? So technically, it takes a lot of courage to uh, stand behind somebody when they made a mistake and be constructive with them. Uh, and you have to look at two things. The employee that I'm dealing with, is this an integrity issue or is this a competency issue? If it's a competency issue, uh, you know, I'm going to try to work with that person until they become a liability and they can't learn the job. But if it's an integrity issue, I have to act because if not, I'm not protecting the house. This guy is still a liability. There's still a threat, whatever the case may be. Uh, and I think when um, administration should discipline is not because they're trying to cover their own ass because... <coughs> You're you're in a high position, and like Russ said, the shit's going to come down on you. So you're getting sued regardless. So you cannot separate yourself from what your team does. You can't. It's just you are the one that oversees it. Uh, but having said that, I think when I when it gets to a point for me when it comes to discipline, it's only because I figure at this point the person is a liability, and I have to do something to show some type of immediate action. Now, I, when I say discipline, I don't mean discipline in the constructive fashion uh, because I will always exhaust the constructive measures first because uh, maybe the employee could be cultivated. Everybody makes mistakes, you know, I, I get it. But if I got negligence or if I got people that are just, people cannot be trusted, uh, then in return, I'm going to give them the extreme. I have to. So like if I got, let's say Joe, Joe's a good worker, makes a mistake, uh, you know, whatever, um, I don't know, doesn't do something he's supposed to do. Uh, and I, when I go to talk to him, it, it's not because, you know, he knew to do it. He just chose not to. It's because he didn't know how to do it or what had to be done. I'm not going to be quick to discipline him. Maybe the problem's on my end. Maybe we didn't train him the way he needed to be. Let me figure that out. So I'm going to be constructive as much as I can until I realize either Joe's good and he's good to go or shit, Joe can't know the job. He can't learn it. And at that point he becomes a liability. So I think for me, the reason why I'm going to say it's a myth is because discipline for administration should only come uh, when there is a liability uh, that has to be resolved, you know, and, 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 and believe it or not, guys, most disciplines that I've seen in my career, if they weren't done, it would go into uh, something where uh, it could ultimately uh, violate uh, some level of trust uh, that the public puts in us. So again, for me, it's more about the the liability and also am I doing enough to support everyone else? 
sometimes people do things for selfish reasons and people are waiting for me to do something about that, you know, as a leader, you know, so, you know, I got a guy that's constantly calling out. And of course the, the union may come and say, well, they got family concerns. They got family concerns and I want to be empathetic. I want to go ahead and, you know, understand where that person's coming from. But once that door is opened, everybody starts doing it. And the only people I'm going to be wind up hurting are the loyal ones who are staying. So we have to make the tough choice and say, hey, listen, I know you have a family concern. And as much as I, 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 you know, I, I would love to help you. The problem is if I open up that door, everybody else, it's going to be your own peers. It's going to literally be your own peers who are going to try to generalize that out. And now the problem is the team that is actually loyal is mad at me because I'm not holding people responsible. But as I said, uh, discipline is not the first for me, it's constructive. So I would say from my perspective, it's a myth. All right. So let's, unless you have something to interject, Will, or we'll go to Joe or, cause I saw you uh, shift anything there. Or no, what? go ahead. Whoever's next. Yep. All right. It's Joe and then Will. All right. So Joe, okay. what do you got? I'm going to say it's a myth. Um, however, there have been exceptions to that. Um, and me being one of them, I've, I've done it myself. Um, you know, again, when it comes to being quick to discipline, I think we need to, I think we need to understand the totality of the, 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 the whole situation before we're quick to react. Um, now there have been times where I personally have done this myself. Um, you know, and, and I'll give an example, you know, we, we had a, a cell move and, <laughs> we had a four cell move and um you know the the video camera operator uh had a technical issue with with the camera um you know am i going to be quick to to write them up no absolutely not because it's it's a training thing but i have you know, issued letters of instructions, which, you know, for, for our purposes is like a, a, a more informal, uh, a more informal disciplinary uh, procedure only because, you know, we've had and worked for administrators that were the write them up for everything kind of deal. And if this was something that I could issue a letter of instruction over a, a simple technical violation where there was no, you know, ill will, um, you know, meant it, it was just a mistake or an accident, you know, and, you know, it's one of those bosses that are, that are totally loyal and dedicated to the job and the mission. You know, I would issue a letter of instruction right off the bat just to keep, um, uh, you know, upper administration or even outside the unit, um, being able to come back and say, fire, fire that employee for that technical violation. Cause I've seen it happen. And, you know, sometimes uh, the senior wardens or, or your senior administration are, are quick to take some sort of action only because they want the control to stay on their unit, inside their unit and not come from above them. So, you know, Ooh. I'm going to say I'm going to say that that it's actually a myth. However, there are circumstances where I have used it myself just to keep the power and the choice of a keeping a good employee employed. Mm. Because, you know, just because they made a, a technical, simple mistake with no ill will involved, there's no reason to overreact and fire that person. And, you know, B, I've seen wardens do the same thing because they want to keep the control of the power of what happens to that employee on their unit and not be dictated to from above. Mm. And, and, and Joe, real quick, is that so if that's sort of what us, that's more of a union thing, but if. Once it's addressed, you really can't readdress it. Absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, that's another concern. Just to get that out there, uh, when there's something being investigated, as much as the staff gets become curious as to what's happening to them, we really can't say anything because the moment we address it or the moment we correct it, uh, you can't go back and revisit the concern. So now if something is deeper in the investigation that we're not aware of and we don't find out till after the investigation, we just violated due process. So a lot of people was like, well, why Matt is not telling me anything. We got to be careful. We have to wait for the results to come back. Um, so what's your thoughts on this, Will? This is a good one for you. Admin quick to discipline. 
I, I'm going to say that it's a myth. I, and I, and I know that from sitting in meetings now in the last couple of years where like you, you brought up, you know, an employee that maybe has some attendance issues or has a disciplinary issue that they're facing. And then they come to, you know, admin and say, well, I've got stuff going on in my life. That's, you know, that's causing me to not, you know, be, you know, maybe as, as productive or as good of an employee as I should be. And, uh, they do take that into consideration. There, there is a lot that goes into, um, the decisions that are made with discipline, unless it's a cotton dry thing. It's if you're breaking one of the cardinal sins of corrections, you know, you're sleeping with somebody, you're bringing something in or, or, you know, whatever. Um, then, then, you know, those things can maybe move a little bit quicker than, uh, you know, or easier to make a decision on than others. But, um, I have sat in on some, uh, some discussions that I was very thankful of, um, that I was very happy to know that those discussions take place and that people are taking, you know, all of the information in, in consideration before moving forward with, with, uh, what they decide to do. So, uh, you know, quick to discipline. No, I know that's the perception. And I know that it, it feels like that for those of us that have sat in front of the investigators or in front of a disciplinary committee. Um, but, but it doesn't. And, and, and because I've also seen officers that have been, you know, terminated or disciplined and then take that up to, you know, whatever, you know, county board or, or, you know, court or whatever and get their job back. So, um, I, I don't think decisions are being made hastily. I think everybody wants to make sure they're ducks in a row. So I'm going to say myth on this one. Yeah. I love that. And guys, when you work for a state that's union, uh, you got to watch out if you're quick to discipline too, because there's so many layers of protection that uh, once you start losing cases on the back end, your credibility lessens, you know, at the end of the day. So um, again, the more you discipline, um, I, I really start to think that you, you do lose some credibility if you're writing up every little thing, not allowing for human error. Um, okay. So now let's go with Joe first on this one. I think this one's an easy one, but let's just get it out there. This one, no stress on this one, Joe. So you better give us an answer. Uh, admin doesn't work a lot of hours. <laughs> a good admin will work a lot of hours. The ones that, you know, like to delegate and, uh, you know, delegate more of their job than they do um, won't work a lot of hours. I can I can honestly tell you from my standpoint that that's that's definitely uh, I'm already uh, I think we're well today's the 28th we're not even all, almost to the end of the month here and, and I've already got 100 hours of comp time so definitely it, it, it's going to depend on the admin um, if they care enough to be in there with their people and get the job done and, and be a part of the team and help out and, and see where they can fit in and, and get things done. Um, that, that'll definitely be a myth. Absolute myth. Um, you know, you do have the mad men's that are straight eight to five and you know, when it's five o'clock, babe, it's yabba dabba do. They're, they're, they're right on down the road with no care in the world. And then, you know, you got those that, that, you know, like my jail, my actual jail administrator, she's there till 7 PM every day just because she wants to be there when both shifts are, are there just so, you know, she can see if they have any needs, you know, is there anything that she can do for them? You know, so definitely, definitely a myth. Yeah. And by the way, guys, the admin as quick to discipline was three to one on the myth side. So three myths, one truth. Uh, I'm going to go ahead for this one and say, admin doesn't work a lot of hours. I'm going to say that's a myth uh, only because, uh, one, work, uh, yes, we're at the f facility on site, um, but granted, we don't want to be there too much because people don't really want us there. They say they want us there, but then we're there. They don't want us there, you know? So uh, sometimes we do do a lot of, um, I don't want to say managing because when I'm at home, uh, and that's one thing, work, 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 home, home, and admin, you're taking work home because they're going to call you. You, you got to call to be notified of certain things and assist with some of the decision making that requires a uh, higher level authority. So with that said, on the administrative level, 
Um, you know, I, I don't just say work is on site. Uh, most of the time you also could be working off site, you know, because stuff happens when you're not there. So I'm going to say that we do commit to a lot of hours, uh, some obviously on location, some off location. Um, but, but I, I think to be honest with you, you can't even calculate, uh, how many hours, uh, in some cases administration is doing, especially if they're the on-call, you know, you really can't calculate it because, uh, they may not be on site, but you know, I, I, I remember Christmas that just passed that one inmate, uh, tied me up on the phone with, with the Lieutenant for over a couple of hours. Now, granted, they're doing most of the grunt work. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying that they're doing the harder part of everything that's happening, but I need the play by play. Cause I got to write everything, report everything up and, you know, make sure that, you know, everything makes sense. in that timeline we got to create before we forward things up. And also death of an inmate, you know, you may not be on site or you may have to go in, but everything that we do, the emails that we send out have to create a narrative that ultimately holds up and, helps the house in case there's any lawsuits. So I would say we put in a lot of hours, whether on site or off site. And even when we're on vacation, we're still taking phone calls. And another thing, if I may add, we put a lot of hours in checking emails because they're constantly coming in. Um, so I'm going to say admin does put in a lot of hours. Uh, and, and you know, what's funny. One last thing. I know I'm saying we'd rather put a lot of hours in, uh, and, and sometimes we put the lot, we're, we're off site and some people may say, well, at least you're off site, you're at home. Let me tell you something, guys, when you're at home and you're trying to spend time with your family and every second you're getting a phone call, you can't even sit there and play a video game or you can't even sit there and watch a movie. Uh, you wish you were at work mm -hmm. because your family is pissed off at you because you're stopping things every two seconds or you just can't play anymore because something just tied you up. So I, I, I think for me, if I have a hectic day, sometimes it's better for me just to pick up my stuff, tell my family, I'm sorry, let me just go, let me go to work because right now I, I don't want to be a distraction uh, to us having a good time, but also I, I really can't be distracted because I got stuff going on that I really need to focus on. And I, I know that hits home with Will too, because a big thing about Will is he, he tries to cope, you know, tries to help people deal with, uh, you know, kind of blending in the work life and the home life. So what's your thoughts on this, uh, Will, with the admin doesn't work a lot of hours? Well, I'd, oh, say, right, I'd say right now it's 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 midnight and, uh, and I have this leash. Um, I am, uh, as most people are, on call all the time. And so um, our, I, I have I have hours that I'm that I go to the office, but um, the 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 facilities run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. And so it if, if things happen inside, we have to respond. Um, we have to get notifications. If, if in my capacity, if a staff member wants to meet for coffee on a Sunday morning to discuss some things that are going on, then that's what I do. If I sit down and I'm sitting down eating dinner and the phone rings at six 30, I have to answer it because I don't know what's on the other end of that call. So, so if it, you know, do I still push trade cards? Well, yeah, I did today. Actually, I pushed some trade cards around and helped some people down, but but uh, so I'm not doing the same work that I was always doing, but I am never off call. I am never off duty in my current position. And and when you're talking, especially me for, you know, I, the drum that I beat with mental health and and being able to have, you know, your your time to refresh, recharge and, and re-energize yourself when you're always waiting for this thing to ring or every time that it rings, you're it, I'm I'm the wellness guy. And so nobody ever calls me and says, Hey, Bill, I just wanted you to know I'm having a great day. I mean, when this phone rings, it's bad. And so then I'm, I'm thinking about that. And now I've, I've got hours of follow up to do. And then, and then get this, Anthony, part of my job is I get in a phone call and an officer telling me I don't want to live anymore. And, uh, you picking an officer up and taking them to the hospital or, or picking an officer up from the hospital and taking them home. There's been nights that I've gone to bed, not knowing if that officer is going to pick up the phone the next day. And so that's not something you can just shut off. That's not something that you can be like, Oh, you know what? Uh, my office hours are eight to five. And so I'm, I'm not worried about this for, for, for me. 
And for the majority of us, um, we're, we're working and thinking and dealing with things all the time. And so, so we may not be, and my, I got a buddy, uh, you guys are kind of familiar with Roland. He, I call him all the time. And if I call him at two 30, he's like, Oh, you know, you, you left the office kind of early today, but that's because my phone rings at four and at six. And, and what he doesn't see is that I was at work, at, you know, at, till two 30 in the morning and, and different things are going on. So th there is a lot of, I won't even say it's behind the scenes. It's just a lot of stuff that goes on that people aren't aware of that, that make a facility run. And so it's, 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 it's a long winded answer to just say that it's, it's not a myth. And I remember years ago when I was a line staff guy and a captain told me, you know, if, if, if officers are upset with the amount of hours they work, they should see the amount of hours I work. And I'm like, whatever, dude, you don't work, you know, because he wasn't in the units anymore. But now I'm sitting in the same meeting with that guy and I'm like, beat because I was up on the phone for four or five hours talking somebody down. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, he's right. Like, this is crazy. So the, 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 the I would say there, there are no hours that we are, mm. it, it's 24 mm. hours a day. I mean, so, so mm. we are, we, we never have off time. So that, I mean, that, that's a, that's a, that's a myth hundred percent. Yeah. So, right. So admin doesn't work a lot of hours. It's a myth. So that's three. And, uh, Russ, I would love, obviously I need your perspective. What do you got uh, Russ, on this one? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that. Yeah, that's, I, I think that I'm not, I'm not even sure how firmly entrenched that, that myth is. Um, I'll say that, you know, I think that, uh, most officers are pretty aware when someone is, you know, less than, uh, less than dedicated and not really into maybe answering their phone or coming in if need be. But I think that, but I think that we also know who all those people are that are going to be coming in when we have, you know, a staff assault or a, or an inmate suicide and aren't going to be sloughing it off. And it's and it's obvious, you know, that there's that there are a lot of phone calls and and emails and things like that. So uh, so I uh, so like I say, I'm not sure how firmly entrenched that myth is. But, yeah, it's 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 absolutely a myth. Admin admin tend to put in uh, plenty of hours and some more than others. Uh, thank, I appreciate that, Russell. That was a sweep. Now, uh, the next you have my you have my PayPal account number, right? Yeah, I'll pay you. I got. I already <laughs> got it right. checked. Right. So now the last two we got are probably two of the most controversial, next to the one above. Uh, so, Will actually, unfortunately, for some reason, well, I didn't do it on purpose. Um, the rotation goes back to you. Um, okay. And I want I want to mention something uh, in case you get people that kind of try to play games. When we when we have these discussions, all because we we draw positivity from uh, to one side doesn't mean we're draining it from the other. So having said that, right. you know, this is not a comparison discussion where if we say admin works a lot of hours, then what are we saying? Custody doesn't work any? No, we know. Right. That wasn't the is, question. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I just yeah. want people to know because you never know. Right, Will? You never know who comes right. in and subjectively has that confirmation bias. No matter what you tell them, they're going to filter it through a very subjective perspective right. that removes them from the reality of, of our discussion. Right. 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 So this one's a tough one. This one's a tough one. So it's going to be Will, Russ and Joe, and I'll figure out where I'll, I'll interject on that. But uh, basically is admin doesn't know what the frontline goes through. So what do you got? Will? dramatic pause. <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna one? no no yeah it is uh no this is this is true and I'm gonna say this I'm gonna say that it's true because you know we spoke about earlier uh if you come from outside of the ranks if you come from outside of this world you you can be told the stories you can get the information from your experts but do you really know do you really feel do you really understand what your people are going through. And, and I don't think you can, and not just because you're administrator, I think just people in general, you can, you can empathize, even take two guys that go through a divorce, right? They're, they, they, they don't completely understand what the other one is going through because all circumstances are different. And so no, uh, administration does not go th know what the front line goes through. And I'll even say this, even if you came up through the ranks and you are now in a leadership position, 
just because you worked a housing unit 25 years ago, doesn't mean what your officers are going through now. And I'll tell you this, when I worked, when I worked in our segregation unit, we had maybe 20 guys and maybe two of them were crazy. And out of those two crazy people, maybe one of them were naked. And, and I went into the, the segregation unit, uh, you know, a few months ago and everybody, first there was, there was 60 people in there. Everybody on the bottom tier is naked. They're all kicking, banging and screaming. There's shit everywhere. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is insane. Like the, the, just in the, in the 20 years that I've been doing it, the job is different than, than when it was when I did it. So, so if I would, if I were to tell a, a, a new boot that came into my office today and, and I, I would be a fool to say, I know exactly what you're going through. I used to have to do what you do because that's not true. Because when I came up, it was a lock. It was, there was, we started touching on rehabilitation a little bit, but it was, uh, you're going to do what I say, do, uh, how do you want to come off the bunk feet first or face first? That's what we do. Now we don't do that anymore. And now we're expecting correctional officers to be, you know, uh, counselors and to know all this crisis intervention and recognize the signs of, you know, suicide prevention, all these things. And then you have chaplains and reentry and, and you have all, all these people coming in mental health and all this stuff come, going on in your unit and the lobby officers calling, Hey, you got to visit, you know, it's like, shut up. So no, I don't even know as a, as a, as a former frontline guy who's, who's freshly out of, out of the trenches. I don't even know what they're going through today. And, and so to say that a guy who's never carried the keys, a girl who's never carried the keys knows what they're going through is it, it's, it's not right. So I'm going to say that this one, this one is true. And, and administrators, the best that they can do. And, and, and really any leader that even frontline sergeants that you've been a sergeant for 10 years, it's been 10 years since you've been in the unit. It's been 10 years since you've had that pressure, those inmates demanding stuff from you. It's so no, you, you may have an idea, but the only way that you're going to actually understand is that if you go and talk to them, if you're willing to listen, if you, if you can, if you can take what their, their reality and their truth and listen to it and take that into consideration when you make your decisions. So I'm going to say that this one is, uh, this one is a uh, fact. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, Will, I got to tell you that the two books you wrote, Home <laughs> Housing Use That Nothing That Ever Happened. Yes, sir. Um, they are insight into what people deal with on the front line. They're tremendous books. And I'm going to say as admin, you do not know what they're going through, how to implement the tactical, how to be on that unit every day, especially now with these empowered inmates that uh, the discipline side of it all is not really as carried out as it used to be. So having said that, the reason why I 100% agree with uh, Will is even though we we know of it, uh, we should because as management, uh, you have to be aware. That's the one thing that's your responsibility is to be aware uh, which means that, you know, once, you know, once you know of it, you know, you, you have to make sure that you're doing things to help uh, alleviate any concerns that the front line may have, but to have to live with it every day or the anxiety of having to go through it the next day, the next day, uh, you know, it, ha not having that escape. And, and I guess the big difference here for me would be uh, an officer can't go out for lunch and an admin can. Right. I mean, it's just uh, it's such a simple comparison, but in that comparison is the moment of an escape. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are trapped in that area and there is no escape and the pounding is there and the inmates are just, you know, unruly. I, 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 uh, I, I work at a tough facility and I, I wrote something recently about um, uh, the extreme of uh, disenfranchised inmates versus, I'm sorry, disenfranchised staff versus entitled inmates. Me and Joe actually had a bit of a discussion on that where you get staff that have given up, but they don't even know that they've given up. Mm. You know, they, they really don't, you know, you got inmates that are running on the tiers and then me as it's admin, I'd be, be walking over to the officers wondering why they're not doing nothing on the surface, on the surface, they may look lazy, but they're not, they're defeated. Right. And that's a whole different approach. If, if, if I got staff that's defeated, I can't yell at them. 
it only makes them further disenfranchised and demotivated. To be honest with you, I, I have to kind of see, hey, maybe I could do something more. Maybe I can roll up my sleeves a little bit and work with them, not for them, but work with them. I, I, I did something today. I did a little short today about hope and, and, and faith because what happened was I had a supervisor that came to me that, you know, went into this unit, which is really uh, a tough unit to deal with. And the inmates were just constant in their persistence of just being very tough to handle. And, and they are, when I tell you guys, it is extremely hard uh, what's going on uh, in some of these units, the, the way the uh, inmates are carrying themselves. Uh, and what happened was the one sergeant is trying to go in there and try to motivate her people. So what you do when you go to motivate is you look for hope. You know, there's got to be something in the horizon. So when she went to go talk to one of her staff, she couldn't give them hope because she didn't want to lie to them. She said, you know what? I felt like I couldn't do nothing because in my effort to be optimistic, I'd be lying because I don't know if it's going to be better tomorrow. Right. Right. So I said, well at, well, at that point, there is something you can still do because she really felt disenfranchised. And, and and by the way, our leaders, our admin, we can never become disenfranchised. I'm sorry, guys, because our job really is to motivate the people that are really going through it. So you have to. So I told her, I said, I, I said, uh, this, this may mean something a little bit. Sometimes you put hope into a situation that you cannot control. And unfortunately, uh, you, people wind up making false promises and then turning their back, hoping that that cliche oh tomorrow will be better works it doesn't but there is something you can do you could put faith in the people around you that we're all in it together and eventually fate becomes hope it just translates through the people and not through the situation so i told her right off the bat and it was a lesson for me because i didn't even know i had that lesson in me but it came into me out of desperation because i wanted to give her something and and i didn't want to leave her with some bullshit answer so i said shift it Shift it from the situation to the person and then just learn that during these tough times, not only do we have faith in each other that will be there together, but we have hope that as that together one day we will uh, go through it. Um, that's so that's that's beautiful. You know, this is it's it's a very lengthy show. And I hope that people get to that part because it is what you just said is is fantastic. It's not about. Thanks. It's not about having the, yeah, I, sorry, you know, your head's going to swell and this is going to be, <laughs> it's not about having the answer guys. It's, 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 and that's, that's what's so difficult and people, you know, especially when you push wellness and you're like, you know, and I'm out there and I'm talking about people, you know, Hey, the job is doing these things to you. This is the effect. And they say, well, that's good, but I'm stuck. I can't get out of it. And, and you have to, you have to focus on, the, you know, the things that you can control your reaction to things and, and to say, look, um, I don't know how this is going to look. I don't know how we're going to get through this, but I'm going to tell you what, that no matter what happens today, I am going to be right beside you and do everything that I can do to get you home safe to your family. Like I know, I know that this situation sucks. I know that, that we don't have enough staff. I know that. I know that I feel that and and I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass. This is, this is corrections is a war zone and, and, and there's a lot of staff that are struggling and that are hurting right now. Right. And, 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 and it seems like that there is no hope, but, but there, but there is because there are people that are out there with you that are working their way through this profession with you that, that understand the weight of wearing the badge, the same as you. And, you know, we'll get out of this situation the same way we get out of every other situation, which is together. I mean, we don't have any answers. We can't make prison stop being prison. We can't make jail stop being jail, but we can do whatever this is together. We've all been called to do this, to serve, to, to, to carry out the mission uh, that is corrections. And, and that's all we got is each other at the end of the day, all we have is each other. And, and that's why the bickering and all that stuff has to stop. And, and, and the, and, you know, these, these questions in these, in this myth and do ad, does admin care about staff? Do they care about inmates? Do they, do we care about each other? 
Because mm. if, if we do, none of that other shit matters. We shouldn't even be discussing that mm. because, because we need to be instilling that hope. We need to be saying, look, it's about me and you right here, right now, getting through this situation. And I don't know how it's going to be, but we're going to, I, we're going to get through this. I always tell people it's going to be okay. Even if it's not okay, we will, yeah. we will figure something out. I don't know what that looks like right now. And I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I do, but, but one foot in front of the other and, and, and we'll see what happens. But if I'm going down, if you're going down, I'm going down with you. That's all there is to it. So, mm. yeah, I mean, I, I, I really like what you said there. Um, fantastic. I hope, I hope people see it. Yeah, I, I actually text you because that's going to be in a blurb in an upcoming book that uh, I, I, once I had the dialogue with the sergeant, I, I I shocked myself and I went and I, I wrote that down not to lose that. So uh, I appreciate that, Will. Maybe maybe if you cut a little short out of this whole section, it goes with your channel. You can, uh, you know, put it Absolutely. up there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now we got uh, Russ. Russ, what's your thought? You think admin, admin, a uh, myth. Uh, admin doesn't know what Frontline goes through. Um, you know, when I, when I think about, um, you know, the position that, that I'm currently in, which I, I, I work with inmates every day still, um, you know, not from um, the position of being behind the badge, but I find, you know, even, even myself, you know, as, as distance happens, you know, from, from the days, you know, that I was first in the profession to the things that I learned and stuff and looking back at it now, I clearly do not know what, um, what a lot of these people are actually going through on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I see some of them, you know, now and then struggling. And I remember my own struggles to a degree. Um, but, you know, some of these, uh, some of these deputies in the facility that I work in, you know, they're there and they're, you know, they're putting in the work and they're putting in the mandated overtime and they're dealing with, with their struggles of, you know, uh, of, you know, getting hurt on the job in one way or another, or dealing with these inmates like, like Will said that, you know, are, are, are naked and, and smeared in feces and whatever else is, is going on with some of these really disturbed individuals. And I have some distance from that, but I can still appreciate it. But I obviously, you know, don't have the same understanding that I once had. And so, and so, I mean, I, I think that that's absolutely true that admin does not know. And I think that they are sometimes, uh, you know, they're sometimes further away from it even than I am right now, um, because I, because my only experience has to do, uh, with, with being in custody. And so, uh, and when we think of it, you know, it's not any one shift, um, that there's necessarily an issue with, although we see some horrific things, but the other thing is, is just, you know, the day to day to day, you know, an unbroken chain of working under those conditions. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, we can have great days and stuff, but, you know, over the long run, you know, it's like that Chinese water torture, you know, one drop on the center of your head every four or five seconds and it, and it drives you crazy. So there's a lot of, you know, accumulated trauma. And um, I think that, you know, that accumulated trauma, it's always going to leak out in some fashion uh, down the road. But truly, you know, admin doesn't know. Admin is not wholly insulated, but they're partly insulated from it you know because that's not their job they're not dealing with it for an eight hour shift they're dealing with the aftermath of a few things here and there and so uh, so ab absolutely they they do not they do not know or they're not able to appreciate fully what line staff is going through all right so that gives us three truths okay joe what do you got on this one that's going to be four truths four truths Absolutely, absolutely agree. Because I, you know, I could tell you without a without a doubt, you know, being a lieutenant today was nothing like when I was a lieutenant twenty years ago. Right. So you can only you can only imagine, you know, being a CO twenty years ago versus being a CO today. You know, twenty thirty years ago, we didn't we didn't have the number of mental health issues that we're having now. Um, you know, the COs are, are working shorter. Um, you know, we're short nationwide on COs. Um, we're, they're, they're expected to do more with less. You know, it, as, as COs, we all worked our asses off when we were COs. But, you know, we had a lot more staff. We didn't have to, you know, here in Texas, I mean, at, at any given point, one officer can be, can be supervising four to 500 inmates by themselves. You know, so they're trying to feed and, 
and get day room and showers and, and pass out mail and, and, and everything that they do, you know, that they used to do for just one pod. Now they're having to do it for six pods, you know, so they're, they're working themselves to the bone, you know, and, and you got a warden or, you know, admin, however it is at your facility that, you know, they were, they might've been a CO 20 years ago. I'm not going to say they don't know what the front line goes through, but I think they're disillusioned as to what they actually go through today. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's easy to sit behind a desk and, and, and say, do more with less, but if you're not, you know, and, and this was one of my, this is one of my main topics when I taught academies for supervisors was that, you know, leadership by walking around, get out there with your folks, understand what they're going through. Get in there and pitch, like, you know, William said, get in there and pitch in and help out. You know, I wasn't a sit behind the desk lieutenant. If we were short, I was out there throwing Johnny's. I was out there, you know, running wreck. You know, even if it was just to, to go do showers and seg for, for the boss and let them take a take a breather, you know, go get a break. You know, if you're not walking around staying in tune and invested with your staff, you definitely don't know what they go through. Because today's times versus 20 years ago, is not even a glimpse of, of the same penitentiary between then and now, you know, we didn't have Priya 30 years ago. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have, you know, ACA 30 years ago. We didn't have, you know, there's, there's so many things now that there's so much more pressure placed upon ACOs for compliance with different agencies and rules and regulations and, and what has to be done. And, you know, and, and now that we're category categorically shorter, because of the fact that, you know, they're expected to do more with less with no show of hope, no, no, you know, show of appreciation, you know, and, and like, and like you said, Anthony, they, they, they feel defeated, you know, they're, they're basically quiet quitting on the runs, yeah. um, you know, and, and that's why it's, it's very important that the administration, you know, get out there and walk around days and nights, get out there and, and talk to your staff get in there and pitch in with them. If, if, if you're fighting side by side with them, you know, that gives them that glimmer of hope, you know, I, and I, I'll brag because I had two assistant wardens that I worked for one female and one male. And I'm telling you, they were two of the best administrators I ever worked for. You know, when, when they called me and, and, and say, Hey Lou, I need you to do this. Hey boss, look, you know, I, I I'm working with this many people today. I'm fixing to go over here to the seg line and help them feed chow because they're behind. You know, we got things we got to get done. And then, you know, three minutes later, I hear on the radio, you know, Warden Warden Glover to Lieutenant, hey, I'm over here on DEF. I'm going to feed Chow over here. You know, when you hear and see those kind of things from your administrators, that that gives your staff that glimmer of hope. That that's that's it's the little things like that that keep them keep them moving forward. You know, and that's and that's what we need more of. Love that. And, and guys, so that swept it. So admin doesn't know what the front line goes through. Uh, everybody agreed that was truth. Now, before we get to the last one, uh, let's see. Actually, we pretty much, we did good, guys. I just want to go do the last kind of go over. So admin comes, uh, admin cares, admin comes, sorry about that. Admin cares more about the inmates. That was uh, three and a half because Joe started off weak. Uh, admin, it, admin powers absolute. Uh, that was four towards the myth, and the three and a half was towards the myth, by the way, for the first one. Admin cares, admins are Monday night quarterbackers, and that was actually two and two, two myths, two truths. Admin needs custody experience. Uh, that was also four. Wait, that, that was also two and two. Admin is quick to discipline. That was three and one on the myth side. Three, one for truth. Admin doesn't work a lot of hours. That was a sweep. Admin doesn't know what the front line goes through. That was a sweep both on, well, admin uh, doesn't work a lot of hours. That was a sweep on the myth. Uh, this one, admin doesn't know what the front line goes through, was a sweep on the truth. And the last question, and this is a tough one too, but we'll start with Russ. Is admin solely responsible for employee morale? No, I mean, uh, you know, we're e we're each grown ups. 
we're each able to make our own decisions. We're each able to make our own choices. And, um, you know, um, admin um, can only be responsible up to a point. Um, you know, they're not the ones, you know, uh, making decisions for you in your life unless that, you know, they're unless they're mandating you excessively. Um, I think that, you know, um, we're all in position to, uh, you know, take control of our own lives. And, you know, and for some people, you know, that becomes necessary to the obvious end of, hey, um, this is not for me or uh, this has become too much and I need to remove myself. Um, admin's, uh, responsibility comes with, you know, having to make the best decisions possible for their people. Now, whether they're actually doing that, you know, is a case by case basis. Um, so they are not responsible, um, you know, in, in, in the sense that, um, see how would I put this? I would say that they're responsible only in the senses as far as that's extended to. Um, is what I should say. So they are not solely, uh, you know, most of it is incumbent upon each of us to make the best of the situation that we can, um, you know, uh, you know, for, for better or worse, I felt that, you know, over uh, my years in the departments that I worked in and so forth, I felt like, you know, I, I carried out things, you know, pretty well. And um, I was always in the face of, you know, necessarily a lot of other officers who were um, you know, less optimistic than, than I was, um, I did, I did pretty good with it. You know, um, did, uh, did I get some, uh, some mental and, and physical wounds inflicted upon me? I certainly did. Um, does some of that seep out even now? It certainly does, but I don't think that, uh, admin is responsible for very much of that. Some of it for certain. And I'll sit down and tell anyone the stories in, in private as it were, but I don't see much sense in, you know, in just, you know, harboring a bunch of animosity. I just like to be able to bring to people the truth with which we are affronted inside of corrections, you know, and it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a dual edged sword. Uh, corrections helped make me into the person that I am today. Um, but by the same token, you know, some of that was, you know, uh, you know, born in, you know, blood and, and, and fire and all the nastiness that comes with it. So, uh, no, uh, admin is not solely responsible for employee morale. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of employees could do better by, uh, you know, uh, quitting, you know, being a sob story, you know, oh, living the dream and all that other stuff, that, nonsense that, that goes along with it. Is there a negative aspect to corrections? Yeah, there certainly is. But, uh, you know, dwelling on the negativity is absolutely nothing for morale so you know get out there and be the best officer that you can be and with uh, uh high levels of professional acumen comes a better toleration for the job yeah and i love that so for me i actually oversee the committee for employee morale so i oversee the, the committee that oversees the morale for all the departments uh all the facilities whatever the different units uh, across the state of new jersey which gives me about uh uh, probably a little over 6,000 or uh, close to maybe, well, 6,000 and change employees. Uh, it's definitely a joint initiative. I believe morale is, morale is a top-down function, uh, which does mean that leadership is a big part of it because uh, if leadership doesn't create the environment uh, for good morale, then nothing that you put in after that uh, will work. It will just be approached with uh, cynicism and, 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 uh, in some cases discuss like even like stuff like uh just my perspective by the way so even like the the wellness program stuff like that if you don't have trust between management and front line uh, you could put these stuff in all day it's just not going to be received well so what i see is morale is what sets the momentum and then all the other initiatives kind of fit in and that's when people are like well why are these things failing well they're failing because the environment's not ready for it you got a lot of things in the uh, in, in the systematic concerns that are affecting uh, what you are trying to implement. And then people are like, well, the, you know, your, this initiative is failing. It's got to be the initiative. No, you put it into an environment that wasn't ready to receive it. You know, it, it's, it's that simple. So for me, what I did was, and the reason why I believe it is a, it's a joint effort. So I'm actually going to say uh, the same as Russ on this. Uh, it's a myth is because, uh, what I did was in order to build trust 
uh, amongst the leadership to start this morale initiative, I needed frontline influence because there'd be resistance. So what I did was I connected to people that are positive about the profession that, um, I, I don't want this to come out harsh than what it is, but I, I'm trying to shift people away from the blame game that you're in control of your own fulfillment. You're in control of, I'm not going to say happiness because that that's a little tough, but your fulfillment should never be in the hands of somebody else. I've worked with managers I did not get along with and I gave them too much power over me and I was miserable. And then I said, Hey, that's on me. I got to mm -hmm. take some of that shit back. So right. what I did was, yeah, what I did was, was I took control of my own fulfillment. Happiness is different. Happiness is fleeing and people could affect that, unfortunately, but your fulfillment, they can't put their hands on. You cannot allow that. So therefore what I did was I made sure that uh, I had intentional effort in, in connecting to my own well-being, my own morale. And then I told, I, what I said for leadership too, is because I, I do work with our leadership as well. I mean, I'm talking about the higher level staff that I'm working with now is when you have a position uh, that you take, that you take, uh, you know, a higher level position, uh, people are going to always see the position first, or they're going to see the history of that position. Joe mentioned before management by walking around uh, leadership by walking around. A good thing about leadership by walking around is that people get a chance to connect to the person if it's done correctly. Uh, because again, if I only see you barely ever, all I see is the position that I, I become guarded. Or if, if someone that held it before you was crap, then I, I, I become less willing to open up. But if I start going around and meeting people and kind of, you know, making the position secondary, that's okay. Make it secondary. Then, okay. You know, Hey, you know, Joe's a good guy. Joe meets. And eventually I'm going to tell you something, guys, position, if you think about it this way, position automatically should be honored, but you want respect and respect goes through the person first. So having said that, what I tend to do is I tend to walk around and earn the respect because the position itself, you know, it, it, for me, it, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day is I want the people to remember me for what I've done. So for me with morale, I do think it's a twofold effort because I think that once you have trust, and we're able to move forward. There's an environment for like an initiative for wellness or whatever it is you're trying to put together. I need staff's effort now. No more excuses. I'm doing something for you. Uh, I know you may have bad dealings in the past, but, you know, come on. It's employee wellness. Come on, join in with me, you know, and, and let's stop. I, just to get it out there, one last thing before we go to, uh, who is it? Uh, Joe and then Will, because I... I Got to get Will's thoughts on this too. Is uh, I, 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 as administration, I was sitting there listening to everybody um, do the blame game. Just ev everything was admin's fault. Everything was admin's fault. And I internalized it. I, 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 I'm human too. I'm in the middle, but I'm human. You know, I could be disenfranchised. I, I could have, uh, you know, I could be depressed and I internalized it because we're always wrong. We're always wrong. And then I said, you know what? Wait a second. Sometimes people that do the blame game, they, they may not take accountability for the things that they can own. And maybe it's easier for them to blame things outward. So I said, well, what are some of the things that that, that we shouldn't blame outwards? Fulfillment. I don't feel fulfilled because management. No, don't give that to management. You're giving them too much power. You know, I, I, I feel... Uh, that this career is a joke because I have a bad manager, a bad manager just destroyed your purpose. I think corrections is the best career, very purposeful. And you're telling me you had a bad manager and now that bad manager makes you second guess the value and purpose that you put into the job. Don't give them that. I know they can influence it. I get it, but you're giving them too much power when they can truly affect how you feel about everything that you're doing day to day. You got to fight. That's the one time I would say that you don't put up the white flag. That's the one time that you got to fight like you wouldn't believe because at the end of the day, that is your survival because then you're going to go through 25 years uh, blaming things that are out of your control, which gives you the comfort to not pursue anything to fix it. When what I say is, you know what, that is in my control. And I am going to go talk to that supervisor and I am going to tell them how I feel, but I don't give a shit even how they take it because it doesn't matter.
The point is, I'm just going to get this off my chest and be done with it. Because at this point, it's about the effort. And I'm not going to get disenfranchised over outcomes I cannot control. Wow. Um, wow. But that just, that's what we're working on now, sort of. But uh, kind of similar to what, what Will's been doing, too. So I can't wait to get to Will. But we'll go through Joe first. And then we get Will. But what's your thoughts on that, Joe? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and I'm going to say it's it's a myth as well. I mean, you know, when it comes to morale, we're we're responsible for our own morale individually. You know, I'm not going to let somebody else steal my shine. I'm not going to let anybody else, you know, take my take my morale from me just because you know they're they're a bad leader, or they're a bad you know coworker, whatever. Um, you know, however, I do I do think that admin is solely responsible for investigating culture and low morale on a unit. I think that's something that, that needs to be getting, you know, gotten to the bottom of to find out why is the morale so bad on your unit? You know, I'm not saying they're responsible for raising it. Uh, they play a part in it, um, but not a solely part. Um, that's something that individually that's, that's our responsibility to do. You know, we can't, we can't, you know, put the blame on somebody else for our, for our own shitty attitude, just because we have a shitty attitude. Uh, that's something that we need to fix ourselves. You know, we can't blame somebody else's, you know, somebody else for our attitude. Um, but with that said, like I said, you know, ad admin should be invested in the staff. They should, you know, be invested in the culture. Um, they should be, you know, investigating, you know, low morale issues trying to get to the bottom of things, you know, sometimes it's bad leadership. Sometimes it's bad policy, you know, uh, there's, there's a whole multitude of reasons why morale could be low. You know, it could be, it, it could be because of Priya, it could be because of ACA, you know, or, you know, like I said, it, it, it could be due to a lot of things, but you know, the bottom line is admin is not solely responsible for employee morale. They play a part in it, but just not solely. Love that. And, and then, Will, I know you got a lot here on this. So what do you got, Will, on this one? It's a good one. Uh, no, I, I you guys laid it out. Uh, you laid it out beautifully. But is admin solely responsible for employee morale? Absolutely not. And uh, I, I just say this, first of all, because when I've been sitting in offices, when I've been in the units, when I've been walking the halls, um, very rarely has that been done with an administrator by my side. When I've been talking an officer through a situation, when I've been running to a code, in fact, never have I been shoulder to shoulder with an administrator in those situations. So when we're sitting in an office and we're complaining that, you know, admin doesn't understand and they don't know what we go through and, and they're not doing this, they're not doing that. I'm the one responsible uh, for lowering the morale, for setting this negative stage at that moment. Not, not, not my boss who we feel like is not doing what they should do. We have a choice in that moment to say, you know what, this is the situation. Let's, let's say what resources do we have on shift right now to get through this and how can we be as positive and as uplifting to help us get through this negative situation. And so you have a choice every day when you go to work, when you get out of bed, when you interact with anybody that you interact with, not only inside the walls, but outside the walls. You have a choice how you're going to handle that. You have a choice whether it's going to be an uplifting experience or if you're going to completely tear that person down. If you get up and you want to be pissed off and you want to look for a fight, then you're going to get it. I mean, that's just all there is to it. You have to be the one who decides, you know what? I, and, and I, I, and I can't remember if Anthony said it or Joe said it, but I'm not going to give anyone that much power over me. It, I, I'm not going to let somebody who sits in an office that I never see or somebody that's never been me. I'm not going to give you the power over whether I have a good day or not. I'm going to find the purpose in what I do in every interaction and in everything that I do every day, I, I intentionally look for a purpose. This is why I'm here. This conversation is why I'm here. This is why I've gone through all the shit that I've gone through. Or even at home when I'm sitting on my porch, watching my kids play, or I'm able to take them to, to, uh, you know, vacation or do whatever. That's the purpose. That's why. And I'm not going to let somebody else take that away from me. I have purpose in what I do. I see the purpose in what I do. And part of what I do 
is uplift other officers, is to tell them that that you have the power to do this, that you can do this, that there are people out there that care for you, love you, respect you, and know that what you do is important. I make that intentional choice every day. I haven't always done that. People that work with me would tell you 10 years ago, I was miserable. I was a miserable bastard, man. I said some crazy stuff. But I realized that all that was doing was 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 hurting me, right? Was was affecting me and and all the people around me. And that's not good. You go in your housing unit, you set the tone for your housing unit. You want you want the the temperature to be lower. You want the interactions to be good. So let's do that for ourselves too. Admin does have responsibilities. Admin does have things that they got to do, but but like Anthony said, when I try to come up with a wellness in initiative at my work or my boss says, hey, hey, Bill, what do you think about doing uh, a workout club or, a, or Thursday night yogas at the facility? I'm like, no, not right now, not yet, because these people are going to eat up and, and spit out anything you put in front of them right now because they're in survival mode. We have to get right now we're triaging. We're 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 it, it's first aid. It's emotional first aid right now. Once we get over this hump, once we start to repair some of those injuries, then we can start to, to have the fun, right? But you have to let people know that they have, we've said this a couple of times tonight, they have the power. You have the power to control your own morale. You have the power. I, I even, Anthony, I, I like what you said about happiness, but I'm going to, I'm going to say this. Happiness is a, is a, is not a destination. It's not a point in time where you're like, oh, I'm happy. And, and this is not, and, and this is exactly everything that I've ever hoped for. But happiness is part of the journey. Happiness is, is, is the long walk to the trailhead and, 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 and the beauty that you see in everyday life. You have to intentionally look for those moments in life where you say, man, life is good. Things are beautiful. And then you have to share that. You have an obligation to share that with the people that are in the same toxic environment that you're in to try to uplift them. So is admin solely responsible for employee morale? Absolutely not. And I'll even say this, they're less responsible for employee morale than the frontline staff is. I would say that the frontline staff, mid-level supervisors, they set the tone for the facility. Because if you're if if what you say is true about administration and they don't understand what you're going through and they're never there and you never see them, then how can they affect anything? Mm. You're the one that's there. You're the one that's controlling the show. You're the one who's 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 choosing to mentor or not mentor. You're the one who's choosing to go over and above or not give that shift briefing or not. You're the one who's choosing to not take into consideration the stress that your fellow coworker is under because you're drowning yourself. You make that decision. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying get over it. I'm not saying, uh, you know, people are, Oh yeah, that's, that's uh, the opposite of what your message is. Well, that's not true. What I'm saying is that the power is within you to do those things. And, and we need to wake that up. We need to show you that, that the facility is not the way it is because of your administrator that rotates out of there every three years. Your facility is the way it is because of the collection of officers, the collection of staff, the collection of professionals that come in and out of there every day and how they interact with each other. That's what affects employee morale. Those are the people that, that make people want to see how many people that you guys know that have retired that say, I don't miss the job, but I miss the people, right? I don't miss the job, but I miss the people. It's the, the reason that I run to codes, the reason that I that I put my life on the line is for the people. It's not for my administrator. It's for the people. And so we have the power, frontline has the power, staff have the power to set the tone for their facility. And if and if you guys are miserable, if you're not receptive to to the initiatives, if you're not receptive to the handouts, to the to the pizza parties that people want to give. Whose fault is that? You're, you're pushing them into a place where they don't want to offer those things anymore <laughs> because all you do is shit on them, right? And I know why you shit on them. It makes sense why you shit on them. But at some point, somebody's got to say, you know what? I'm in charge of this. I'm going to eat that pizza pizza. I'm going to bring some pizza up for the rest of the people on the floor. We're going to have a good fucking day here. That's what we're going to do, despite everything else going on. Mm -hmm. So frontline, 
is in charge of that. Administration plays a role and that's great. And they're going to come up with those things and, 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 and fantastic, but just as equally as important as the role that we play. Sorry. Soapbox over. Sorry. No, no, that was phenomenal. The, uh, that was a sweep. And we had a discussion the other day about morale and I actually, I knew the answer was it's frontline uh, that really has the bigger initiative on that But And you could actually hear me say it, but I think for me to get the people to accept the message, I think I said like 60, 40, uh, where I gave it a management cause I wanted people to accept it. But I actually said in the video, but I, it's, I think you are the majority, but with that said, I will, unfortunately I conceded. So it was good that for you to say that thought because I, uh, for some reason, usually I speak my mind, but I think I was, it wasn't about not having the courage to say it, but I wanted the message to be embraced. So what I did was I, I put, a, a, I, I wanted the message to be embraced that there is a level of onus on front line. And I thought it was too crazy to jump in and say, you know, 70, 80%. So right. I wind up doing like 60, 40, even though I try to shift. And I want to mention one other thing too, uh, before, before we go to close is that, uh, some people may watch older videos and they may see a message that conflicts. Uh, I may not even say totally the opposite, but some level conflicts. That's because as we do the shows and we have these discussions, we're growing. And if we're constantly saying the same message, then we stop growing. There have been people I've looked up to that all of a sudden I love their class. I take it the first time I love it. I'm like, Oh man, I'm a rookie and this guy's teaching me some great knowledge and 25 years later, they're teaching the same thing. And I'm like, this guy stopped growing. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer interested in what this guy has to say, but it was crazy on day one. I was. So uh, with that said, uh, guys, this was just a great dialogue. I guess we'll, we'll start getting the closing, but uh, this could definitely be a class that we could give uh, just together, just to, a, 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 you know, basically go on the road and teach, uh, eight myths about prison administration or, right. um, but, uh, we'll start with, uh, Joe first. Hey Joe, uh, what the hell were you doing? Joe, you, were you doing a Jeffrey Tubin? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, <laughs> what was that? That was a, uh, uh, that was a side text that was sent to me by my wife that, uh, mm. Anyway. Uh, okay, okay. So uh, uh, a close Jeffrey Tubin situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Joe, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, just to kind of, it, it's been a great discussion, you know, as far as myths and, and, and truths. Um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we're all responsible for our own individual happiness. You know, what we project is, is what's received. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Never let Never let anybody steal your shine that, you know, never let anybody take your happiness from you. You know, at the end of the day, when you leave, you're still you. And that's something that you should never let anybody take from you, regardless, you know, where you're at. Um, you know, if you're on the front line, I would I would suggest and, and actually, you know, implore you to maybe dig a little deeper and, and understand the bigger picture and in, in, into the reasons why that we do and, and the choices that we make. It's not necessarily that we're going against frontline staff. It's, you know, because we have to make decisions on a bigger level and a bigger picture. And sometimes you guys don't get to see that whole picture, you know, for the leaders, you know, we need to open our lines of communication, both up and down with our frontline staff and our administration. Like I said, be that bridge, you know, to help them gain a better understanding of, of what's going on. You know, sometimes we're our own worst enemy when we make decisions and, and not explain things fully to the people underneath us. Um, and that's something that we need to work on. Uh, communication in general is just something we need to work on as a, as a better, you know, just to make things better for everybody. Um, with that, you guys stay safe and it's been one hell of a conversation. Yeah, this was a good one, guys. That's why I mentioned some. So I'm going to go to Will now. And for Will, I'm going to say, Hey guys, if you want to know more about Will, he's got just corrections, YouTube channel. He authored two books available on Amazon when home becomes a housing unit and, uh, the nothing that never happens. Uh, Joe, you can email him and, and Russ, you can email him. Okay.
<laughs> guys, get the books out, man. Get, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, hey, Will, what do you got in closing, brother? Uh, here's what I'm gonna say. I to 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 really to really grow in this profession and really in life in general, you have to have conversations and and listen to perspectives that are uncomfortable. And I know that on both sides of the fence, admin, admin and frontline, um, there's going to be things that have been discussed or said tonight and then throughout your, you know, your tenure that, that piss you off that you don't understand. But the, 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 you have to find the common ground. Joe said it several times tonight. You have, there has to be a bridge, right? And if you don't currently have that bridge in your facility, then, then you have to be the bridge. And, and, and the only way that you will grow is if they do, you are willing to accept that somebody doesn't feel the exact same way that you feel. So when you guys are listening to this, you're watching it, you're going to comment, you're going to be angry. You're going to say, you know, uh, Anthony and, and Will and Russ and Joe, they don't, they don't know. Uh, and, and I'm going to say, yeah, we don't, we don't know. All I, all I know is, is what I know. And the only way that I'm going to learn is that if you'll have a rational conversation and sit down and talk about it. And that's the beauty of this platform. And that's the beauty of what we're all trying to do here is to have discussions, to push the profession forward, to get correctional staff, the respect and recognition that they deserve. Um, and with that, I will concede to the next uh, to the next gentleman. Thanks for having me on, Anthony. Ah, thanks, Will. Uh, what about you, Russell? <laughs> Russell. <laughs> so I got all kinds of things to say right now, but um, but no, I, I think this is this has been a, a fantastic conversation. I, I would I would place what we've done here tonight and. And maybe the the top three or four uh, you know uh, tier talks that I've ever done. Wow. Um, I I mean I, I I think it's been that great, and that I think that's just a testament to what what all of us do. And you know I think one of the one of the things that we're doing here is actually trying to help people find that path that they can stay on to make uh, you know corrections a sustainable uh, type of professional uh, a profession, a sustainable career if you will. And so I'm, I'm jazzed about that. And, you know, I hope that everyone out there listens to this, you know, is uh, funny listening to, to William earlier, you know, talking about, you know, uh, wanting to, you know, approach Anthony for doing something, you know, and kind of having a little bit of that, you know, that star struck aura there. But, you know, the, the truth of it is, is that all of us here are accessible and approachable and, you know, I just hang out on, on channels, uh, you know, when I can and just I'm in it to, you know, help the average um, correctional officer, because I remember how hard it was when I when I got into this. And so um, and so it just, you know, kind of, you know, makes me feel good that I think I think we did a good thing here tonight. And I think it's going to, you know, force some people to maybe reexamine uh, their, the way that they particularly looked at it. And I think it's going to, you know, maybe, uh, maybe hopefully they will approach us and, you know, uh, we can have our two cents worth and put some ideas out there or just even, you know, talk someone through, you know, it's, it's not an easy profession. Um, it's, it's going to be hard, uh, whether, um, whether you have a good administration or not. And so, uh, you know, that's the thing that, you know, I really look forward to is, is always being able to get in there and, uh, you know, help help a correctional officer, help a correctional deputy and just, you know, try and uh, do our best to kind of get through it together. And that's about all I have to say about that, except for the little thing that Anthony brought up. Um, it's, it's funny that today of, of all days, I was, uh, I was looking at an interview um, that he did uh, uh, with uh, Jeffrey Tubin and uh you know, there's a guy that watched his whole career slip right through his fingers. All right, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, that, that was good, Russ. Did you, you, what were you watching? The, the CNN video? Yeah, the CNN video. And oh. I actually <laughs> left, I actually left that remark. So you can check it. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest about it. I actually left that same remark on there about, gotta, about seven, seven or eight hours ago. 
I, I'm going to look for that. I've been doing a lot of stuff with, with uh, News Nation now. I like them a lot. They seem to be more objective. Uh, I just want to say here uh, what we did and kind of going with the metaphor of the bridge, the bridge of understanding is I, I, I think that this us versus them, frontline versus uh, management or or peer to peer or whatever, department to department, whatever it is, is really generalized animosity based on assumptions. And assumptions come when you don't understand each other's perspective. So what we did basically is we put everybody to the table and let's air out these assumptions. It, it's fine. It's like a personality conflict. But then when you bring everybody together and it always, well, I thought you meant this and I thought, and then you guys don't speak. And then we just let shit fester. So today we decided to remove generalized animosity and let's provide some understanding. Now, granted, I, I can't make you agree with it, but, but to be honest with you, I think the stuff that we put out the table is definitely something worth listening to. And then maybe opening up further discussions with those that lead you. You know, maybe there are things that you don't understand. And, and I will say one last thing, guys. Sometimes these animosity, these generalized automatic, it's just because we have stuff that's lost in translation. I mean, it's just simple stuff that's lost in translation, which is translation, which is one question. A simple why. Something simple could alleviate this. But instead, we let it fester. And next thing you know, every time shit hits the fan, we go in a cover your own ass mode instead of really joining together like we should. As always, guys, the show is tiered up. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Take care, guys. Stay safe.